God morgen, da har vi kommet til siste forelesning på et litt sånn annerledes semester. Både for dere og for meg. Vi har snudd om på programmet i år, fordi jeg hadde pappaperm, og så har det jo blitt... Unnskyld og takk, jeg er med. Oi. Heldigvis... Og så har vi testet å slå av mute på alle som kommer med, så det blir jo interessant. Men ja, det har vært et interessant semester med korona og det hele. Så det blir spennende å se hva dere syns. Nå ser dere min skjerm i hvert fall, forhåpentligvis. Vi begynner bare med, dere har blitt vant til dette her også. Vi har jo hatt 12 eller 13 forelesninger sammen. Se om folk er med. Så har det jo stabilisert seg på cirka... 47-48 mennesker, så jeg regner med at det er de samme som er med til slutt. Og det er jo også en indikasjon på hvem som er engasjert og hvem som ikke er engasjert. Eller kanskje det er også en indikasjon på hvem som har veldig mye å jobbe med utenom skole. For det har vært en del folk som har jobb ved siden av. Hva har du lært mest om siden sist? Det er jo spennende å se. Vær utforskende og aldri gi opp. Det er bra. Jeg tipper også at jeg fikk en mail fra høyskolen i går om at de kommer til å begynne å bruke mentimeter i flere undervisninger. Så... Jeg synes i hvert fall mentimeter funker veldig godt, for da får man, når det er så mange på en telefonsamtale eller en telefonkonferanse, så er det ikke like lett å få tilbakemeldinger fra alle. Gå videre. At jeg savner økonomidelen av studiet. Dagen i dag. Vi skal ha... Oi, sånn. Der, ja. I dag, i og med at vi er på Zoom, så er det jo en unik mulighet til å få litt internasjonale impulser. Så i dag så har jeg klart å få en som heter Manuel Da Costa. Han kommer fra et firma som... Han har startet et firma som heter Effective Experiments. Han kommer til å komme på klokken 9.30. Og han er en av de menneskene i Europa som har mest greie på testing og eksperimentering. Han driver et firma som har laget et system for å gjøre det enklere å teste. Og så er han også ganske sentral i konferanser om testing og eksperimentering i Europa. Han driver også en podcast som heter Conversations, tror jeg den heter, hvor de diskuterer testing. Og de av dere som har vært med hele tiden, de husker jo at jeg sa en gang for lenge siden at testing, det er noe av det viktigste innenfor digital markedsføring. Og sjefen i Amazon, han sier jo at antall tester de kjører hver dag, hver uke, hver måned, det er en direkte årsak til at Amazon har blitt verdens 
mest värdefulla sällskap eh, och Jeff Bezos har blivit världens rikaste man. Så testing det är er, er, det er nog vi ikke har snakket så mycket om, men eh, det får vi då en införing i idag eh, fra en av de som kan mest om det i Europa. Så jag har ikke snakket med Manuel da Costa på jag har ikke truffet ham på ett par år. Så det blir väldigt spännande att se vad han har lärt sig sist också. Och så ska vi också ta en uppsummering eh, og en spörundersökelse. Kommer att göra någon eh, spörundersökelse i klassen efter att Emanuel är er färdig. Eh, men eh, så kommer jag också att sända ut en mail med en undersökelse. Och så till slut idag så ska jag ge dere ett karriärramverk eller ett eh, ett rammeverk som eh, väldigt många brukar men som vi har då tillpassat till norsk och till eh hur vi brukar det i i Nevo. Och det kan ju det bruka vidare också för att kartlägga egen kompetens och så se efter hull i vad det borde lära mer om. Eh detta har ju varit en lite sån annorledes upplevelse regnar jag med i förhåll till andra klasser både i klassrummet och jag vet inte det har kanske inte haft så mycket Zoom undervisning. Men eh, jeg skal bare gi dere en kort eh, oversikt over tankene, eh, hvordan jeg har lagt upp undervisningen, fordi det oppleves jo kanskje litt kaotisk. Eh, men här ser dere hvordan eh, undervisning var på 1950-tallet. Da ser du at TN det er jo en teacher eller lærer eller foreleser, og så sitter alle studentene og lytter. Eh, Og undervisning har ikke utviklet sig så mye. Jeg regner med att det mange av de klassene dere har haft både på barneskolen, ungdomsskolen, videregående og tidligere studier, har sett litt sånn ut. At det står en foreleser og snakker til dere. På 1990-tallet så har man gjort det litt annerledes. Dette var når jeg gikk på ungdomsskolen og och universitet då började man att sätta folk i grupper och så var det fortsatt läraren som snackade till grupperna men det är er fortsatt väldigt mycket en till många kommunikation. här ser du hur modern undervisning föregår och så hoppas jag att jag har lagt till rette för detta. Här ser du att läraren syns nästan inte. Läraren står lite på lite sån utanom mye av läringen. Här ser du att det är er studenter som brukar internet, det är er studenter som sitter i grupper, det är er studenter som får idéer fra masse olika städer. Og och det är er lite kaotisk. Og det hoppas jag att det har upplevt denna klassen som också. Og så är er det jo om att göra och finna ut vad är er den optimala måten att lägga upp undervisning på. Så Jag vet inte vad den optimala måten er, men jag driver och utforskar. Men jag hoppas ju att uh, det har lärt, det har blivit inspirerat lite av uh, den fällesundervisningen och så att det har lärt väldigt mycket på på egen hand. Ska se här. Ja. Uh, og det som jag har uh, lagt upp till detta här här ser det också web marketing matrix är er att vi har varit inom väldigt många ting i denna klassen och i annars en del så kommer det till att antagligen ha lite mer struktur på undervisningen men vi har ju varit inom många av dessa punkterna i web marketing matrix och det har ju också haft anledning till att lära genom att göra och det är er otroligt gøy att se hur man det har lärt på olika måter Så det blir spännande att se eh, på tillbakemeldingen vad det syns är er bra och vad det syns är er dåligt. Ja. Och då är er det han Manuel da Costa, han kommer att komma på, vi ser om han är er på allerede. Men hvis det har några frågor nu så är er det bara att skriva ner. Jag hoppas det eller jag regnar att det har massor av frågor om examen, men vi har brukt eh, i hvert fall en föreläsning till att besvara frågor på det så jag hoppar det är er mindre oklarhet uh, runt det nå än det var uh, tidigare. Men uh, gör gärna lite ta Google han Manuel da Costa lite och så förbered gärna lite frågor uh, till han. 
Jag har förberett en del frågor, men jag hoppas det har eh många frågor till han också. Eller så är det bara att snacka också. Nu är det ett par minuter till han kommer på, hvis han inte är på allredig. Er det noen som har noen spørsmål? Skulle vi ikke ha om growth hacking? Jo, vi skulle det, men han som, han som vi hadde i fjor, han kunne ikke på de datoene. Så eh, jeg skal snakke med Anders, så skal vi prøve å få growth hacking. Growth hacking er, hvis du søker opp growth hacking og hører på noen av de, de som kan mest om growth hacking, så er det bare et begrep som dekker mye av digital markedsføring, og så er det en eh, testmetodikk, en prosess. Eh, og vi hadde, vi hadde en forelesning om eh, traction med alle disse ulike kanalene, og det minner veldig mye om growth hacking. Så, og det dere har vært igjennom også med å sette opp nettbutikker og sånn, det er mye av tankegangen bak growth hacking. Man må bare teste seg fram og lage en prosess og måle og utforske og finne smartere måter å gjøre ting på. Så growth hacking er et uh, litt sånn hypet begrep, men uh, uh, de som kan veldig mye om growth hacking, de sier bare at det er prosessforbedringer og kontinuerlig testing og digital markedsføring. For alltid analytics i eksamen er det et visst antall data vi må ha for å kunne lage en analyse. Hvis vi får lite trafikk, så kanskje det er ikke er mulig å, la å lage en egen analyse. Eh, dere kommer til å ha mye mer om eh, analyse eh, i Anders sin del. Hvorfor skal vi skrive blogginnlegg om noe vi nesten ikke har lært? Det er en del av prosessen også, at eh, deres, det, man, det er mange som lærer ved å skrive. Det er også den måten jeg lærer mest på, at man må gjøre research, og så må man strukturere tankene sine, og så skrive. Og blogginnleggene deres, det er, det er jo også en sånn måte å, selv om dere ikke kan mye om et tema, ved å skrive om det, så kan dere også etter hvert forbedre de blogginnleggene. Så et blogginnlegg, det som publiseres på nett, det kan alltid forbedres. Og det, det er en del spørsmål om tidligere også, fordi når dere har skrevet et blogginnlegg, så er det ikke sikkert at uh, helt fram til denne dagen hvor sensor går inn, eller den dagen dere publiserer et screenshot av et blogginnlegg i eksamensoppgaven, så kan dere faktisk forbedre det. Og så er det jo, skolen har jo noen deadlines, men, uh, og de er det jo viktig å forholde seg til, men... Uh, det er jo sånn at sensor leser jo ikke det før det er sendt inn til, til inn i systemet. Eller tilfeldigvis går inn på en av blogginnleggene deres. Så et blogginnlegg kan alltid forbedres. Der er... Hallo, Manuel! Hallo. Uh, Hallo, kan du høre meg? Kan du høre meg? Jeg kan høre deg fint. Kan du høre meg også? Yes. I'm going to make you a co-host so you can share your screen. Okay, sounds good. Uh, I've already introduced you. Uh, okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, so, uh, here we go. Uh, this is Manuel da Costa. Hey guys, uh, how are you doing? I realize everyone's on mute, so you don't need to respond. <laughs> yeah. There's a chat. Uh, have you used Zoom before? Yeah, we use it every day, so... Okay, so there's a chat function that you can um, that you can also see uh, that people can pu publish questions in. Okay, sounds so, good. So uh, as soon as people warm up a little bit, I think there's going to be more questions. That sounds good. Um, cool. Hey everyone, uh, thanks for joining. And uh, uh, KP or Philip, what? I, I can't remember what we what we called you. So KP uh, works. Uh, yeah, yeah, KP works. So, great. So thanks for having me on. Um, it's uh, fairly early in the morning right now over here. So it's I'm just kind of get, getting started with my day. And as you can see, I've got a, a background that just doesn't work uh, perfectly fine. So uh, anyways, 
so um, I'm here, um, KP's invited me to talk to you about experimentation. Uh, it's something that's really close to my heart. Um, I have been involved in uh, experimentation for uh, coming up to nearly 10 years now. So a long time kind of working on the um, uh, practitioner side, uh, but then also working uh, with businesses, uh, consulting with uh, C-Level as well. Uh, but uh, KP, just uh, clarify with me one thing. Uh, you've mentioned that uh, uh, the, the students are going to be launching an e-commerce store as part of their assignments. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, some of the students have already launched. Uh, and uh, after, or we can also discuss uh, looking at, or we can also show you some of the stores so you can uh, give some feedback uh, if you'd like. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, so just show fans, uh, or you can just, well, chat rather. Uh, how many of you guys have actually launched your e-commerce stores already? Uh, do you want to just say yes or something in the chat so I know like I can just get it? Uh, and then we can kind of uh, maybe use your sites as well to have a discussion well, about, about this. Why don't people that have launched uh, publish the URL of the e-commerce store in the chat? That way, uh, yeah, that, that's use. actually a good idea. Yeah, sounds good. Cool. One of the uh, one of the groups has also uh, uh, a journalist uh, has written about them in a local newspaper. Oh, wow, that's so, that's really good. And I think a, a few others have also uh, connected with some uh, local newspapers. Oh, brilliant! That that's good. Good stuff. So. Um, I'll get started. Uh, what I'm doing in this uh, session is kind of giving you a primer about experimentation and how that's going to help you with your e in the context of the e-commerce stores. Uh, experimentation itself is quite a, a deep subject, so I don't want to uh, go into every single detail, but what I will do after this call as well is give KP some uh, links, some resources that he can then share with you so you can read in your own time as well. And um, make use of it. Um, cool. So let me just uh, share my screen with you over here. Share my screen. Uh, let me know if you can see my screen over here. Yes. Uh, cool. So this is, uh, I'm calling this uh, little talk over here called Experimenting Your Way to Success. Uh, and the first part is what is experimentation? Um, and really, uh, what have you heard about experimentation? So again, uh, what I want to, uh, to do also in this, uh, in this um, talk, I just don't want it to be a one-way conversation. I want it to be interactive. Um, if there is anyone sleeping, please wake up and be involved. Um, and, um, you know, use the chat. Let's, let's have a conversation. So uh, my question to you is, what have you heard about experimentation? Uh, or if you've not heard of it before, please feel free to say, no, I haven't heard of it before which is great as well and also i urge people to turn on their video so manuel can see you guys uh it's a lot easier to speak to people than to speak to a black a picture yeah true <laughs> i oh. have that challenge quite a lot of times but yeah. that's fine there, there are a few people on there so uh, I, hopefully we can i can say some people. of the things uh, one quote that i've um, mentioned earlier is uh, jeff bezos's quote about testing that um, uh, Amazon is a result of uh, how many tests Amazon runs every day, every week, every month. Um, yeah. And that testing is very important, but we haven't touched very much on the subject, but all the students have, uh, have taken uh, the Facebook blueprint or many of the students have taken the Facebook uh, blueprint exam and also uh, certifications in Google ads and Google analytics. Um, Great. So, and those exams are, uh, they touch upon experimentation quite a bit. Okay, sounds good. So you might have heard of, of words like this, right? A-B testing. If you're talking about Google ads or Facebook ads and stuff like that, you would have either seen this online somewhere like A-B testing or split testing, conversion optimization, CRO, uh, or sometimes even people mistake it for UX design or growth hacking. Growth hacking is quite a common one that you will come across. Um, and what I want to try and do uh, on this um, conversation with you is to really give you the truth about experimentation because there's a lot written online and there's a lot written online that'll make you think that, yeah, this is really amazing and we can you know, uh, do magic with it. 
there's that aspect to it, but there's also the reality of it. Uh, to me, experimentation is more of a mindset than anything else, right? Uh, when you're uh, launching your, your own stores or in the future, if you're working in uh, digital companies or e-commerce companies, the mindset of experimentation is more important than anything else. And uh, as uh, KP just said, uh, Jeff Bezos, right? Amazon itself uh, runs a lot of experiments. Um, you know, I don't even hazard a guess, but there's, I think there's at least a, a more than a thousand experiments going on at any given point in time. If you've been online, if you've got a mobile phone with, an, uh, with apps on it, if you've um, gone uh, you know, to shops and stuff, you are more, more than likely have been part of an experiment. Right, uh, you may have seen uh, different things, but you would not even know that you're part of an experiment, and that's the whole purpose of it. Uh, experimentation as a mindset is when an organization, whether it's your organization, whether it's the the organization uh, that you work in, it's their willingness to test and learn from that, and that's what experimentation is. Because quite often, um, you will ha you will come across um, either, you know, people that have what we call a fixed mindset and uh, a fixed mindset is one that says, I know how everything works and I'm not going to, uh, listen to anything else. And so you end up in, in situations where you come up with all these ideas and you try and innovate, but really everyone, you know, they, they would rather have things stay the same. Right. Uh, and so th this is really key because how does experimentation actually work in organizations? Uh, ex uh, currently, in most companies, you will have CRO or experimentation sitting in the marketing department because that's where usually the most uh, value or perceived value comes from. So you have an experimentation team that's responsible for improving the customer experience, but more importantly for the business, improving their revenue, right? So increasing um, the revenue coming in. And that's the, the kind of perceived value of experimentation. But it goes way beyond that. So what I wanted to try and, and talk uh, to you about is in the sense of your e-commerce store, all right? So you, in your e-commerce store, um, so if anyone wants to answer these questions, you know, you're launching an e-commerce store right now. How are you, how are you bringing in visitors? Um, how are you, and for the people that have already launched the, the sites, uh, you know, how are you going to bring in visitors? How are you going to make sure those visitors convert, uh, you know, buy from you? And how are you going to make sure that your visitors, the people that became customers, come back and buy from you again? So do you want to uh, um, maybe share with me how you're currently doing that right now? KP, do you want to pick someone at random? <laughs> uh, I urge everybody to add Manuel on LinkedIn. Uh, he's just, an, he's, He's very good at what he does, uh, but he's also just a normal person. So don't be afraid of speaking up. Uh, that's also yeah, a good I, uh, way I don't of bite. learning. So who wants, to, who wants to answer the question about that Manuel just asked? Uh, let's, see. let's see the people that are posted on here, right? So again, this is, there's no right or wrong answers. Don't worry about this. Uh, uh, Ingrid? Uh, Ingrid Hammer, are you here? Ingrid? <laughs> it's pro probably run away now. <laughs> you prob have you, have you uh, held presentations in Norway before? Me? Oh, yeah. people are really quiet over there? Yeah, but Norwegians rarely ask I, questions uh, in big... Uh, I think I remember this now. When I was in, uh, in Oslo, when, when I met up with you and that presentation I gave... Um, a few years ago now, um, in the winter, I think it was. Yeah. I thought people were just cold or something, but oh well. <laughs> it's so, fine. I'll, I'll go with the answers myself, right? So yeah. you're launching an e-commerce store. There are, there, are, there are things you're doing to bring in traffic, right? So you're doing paid ads, your Google ads, your Facebook ads, and organic traffic SEO. So you want people to come onto the site. And on the site, what are they doing? Uh, there's page views and then there's sales, right? So they're, they're buying stuff, they're looking at stuff. And then finally, when after they buy stuff, there's post-purchase emails. And really, 
uh, you want them to come back. So there's retargeting. So every step of the way, there's an opportunity to improve. I know like words like experimentation and optimization, if you're not familiar with them, you're like thinking, what is this? Think of it as improvements, small tweaks, small improvements. So each of these, uh, these steps is a way to improve. You're bringing in traffic. If you're paying for those ads, uh, maybe uh, in the future or now, if you're paying for those ads, you want to try and get that spend down. You want to try and get more visitors for less money. You want your, your SEO rankings, if your, if your website is ranking higher, you want that to result in sales. Being number one doesn't mean anything if, you, if you're not getting any sales on the back of that, right? Or you're not getting any value on the back of that. So if people are coming onto the site, how many pages are they being? What are they doing on there? Are they buying stuff? All these things, you want to be uh, watching that and improving that each um, each step can be improved. And if you then improve it a little and a uh, little by little at a time, you then end up with a, a well-oiled machine that is that, you know, predictably that you can put a certain amount in $1 in and you're getting $5 out or, uh, you know, whatever uh, that, that ratio is. So experimentation is, is actually really simple. I want to break this down into, into something that you can actually use. It's, it's about observing. Uh, it's about crafting what we call a hypothesis our, uh, based on our observation. It's about testing that hypothesis. And then it's from, about learning from that hypothesis, uh, learning from the outcome. And then finally, iterating and uh, gradually improving. Okay. Can you walk us through uh, an example of all those steps or is that what you're going to do? Yeah, I'm going to be doing that now. Right. So, so this is experimentation. Again, as I said, I'm trying to keep it uh, uh, less about the jargon of, uh, around it to give you um, a good way of understanding it, right? So let's look at it in the context of you guys. And let's say you, your e-commerce store has this landing page right? uh, or this checkout page, I mean. You have a checkout page that is, you get loads of visitors coming onto this page. Let's say a thousand visitors come onto this page and only two of them buy, right? And so my question to you is what is wrong on this page? What is wrong? Uh, again, I'm not expecting any answers right now, but um, I'll continue. So Wait, which company is this? Or is uh, this, this is a this is a no name uh, this is a no name brand. I just picked this up online just because okay. it, it had a, a lot going on on here, right? Yeah. Um, and the Anybody idea we try yeah, to answer. Yeah. Does anyone want to go? Uh, so it's okay, no, we just silent. Yep. Is there yeah. be, like is that not optimal because there is too much uh, like that has to be filled out to complete the order or? Okay, that that was was that. Uh, Magnus or Vetle? Vetle, okay. okay. Or was okay. it Magnus? Thank you for uh, contributing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one. Uh, there's too much to fill in. That's one. Anyone else want to have a go and say and hazard a guess as to why this might be problematic? Why why so many visitors not buying at this point in time? In shipping costs. Okay, that's another one. So shipping costs too much to fill in. That's two. Uh, maybe not enough uh, payment options. Maybe not enough payment options. Three. Okay. Let's take two more. Too much personal info. Uh, uh, Benjamin, uh, too much personal info. That's four. One more. Anyone? Last person. Okay, we'll stop at four then. That's fine. So there's four different things we've, we've, we've uh, looked at. Too much information, too much to fill in, shipping costs, uh, uh, no security for purchase. Matt's uh, coming through with another one, right? So there's, there's a few of these. Now, here's the, here's the reality of the situation. I don't know why this doesn't convert just yet. At this point in time, I do not know why this doesn't convert. I can guess just by looking at it. But here's where, what you should be doing instead. So you have some ideas as to why this might not be converting. No security, too much personal info, too much to fill in shipping costs, etc. So the first step in experimentation is observing, right? 
And by obs- I don't mean just looking at the page and coming up with random ideas. It's like, okay, you, you, have a, you have a gut feeling as to what might be wrong, but here's where you take it one step further. Who has Google Analytics on their site already? I'm assuming you guys should have it already, right? Uh, you can just nod or say yes. So people are saying yes. Okay, great. Google Analytics. What can you learn from Google Analytics? I'll answer that question if you want. Uh, you can you you can easily see the percentage or the numbers of uh, visitors on each page at, at a given point in time. And if you see a high percentage of people dropping off on this page, there's a warning sign over there. You've already got that warning sign. And, and that's what made you look at this page, right? You've seen uh, only about two out of 100 people are buying on this page. Let's have a look and see what's going on. Now, there are other tools out there that can actually help you observe customer behavior on your site. And maybe you have this uh, on um, your page. So Google Analytics is what we call a quantitative analysis tool because it tells you, you know, uh, in, in numbers, uh, what's happening on your site. 10 people bought, 100 people left the site. It tells you numbers and percentages. So yes, it does tell you how, how people behave on your page. That's what Matt said. But there are other tools that will take it one step further. And uh, some of these tools uh, are uh, a good example is Hotjar. Uh, has anyone come across Hotjar before? Uh, KP, have you? Uh, nope. Okay. Hotjar is a, a really good tool because it, it goes a step further. And there are other tools out there that are, that are free as well or uh, that, that may be cheaper. I don't know what Hotjar's pricing is at the moment. But um, you're able to uh, go onto the website and uh, put out what we call session recordings, right? Session recordings allows you to actually see a recording of the visitor on the site as they scroll, as they move about. And that actually gives you um, a clear view. So let's say this checkout page that we were looking at, that's kind of uh, losing visitors. If we enable session recordings, maybe uh, with, with privacy and stuff on this page, we would see uh, you know, where they're clicking on, what are they, how are they scrolling, how are they navigating? Hotjar also has heat maps, uh, heat maps that allow you to see what parts of the, the page they've scrolled to, what parts of the page they've not even seen. Um, it also allows you to see what, part, what fields might be problematic in form analysis because they, you might uh, have a faulty field in this that you haven't picked up. But tools like Hotjar and other form uh, analytics and um, heat map tools out there give you information above and beyond what Google Analytics gives you. So Google Analytics is uh, quantitative. Uh, hot, something like Hotjar is going to give you a lot more information that you can now start adding to your, your observation. So we're still observing customers and we're saying, okay, there's a, there's a fault on this page. And now we're also noticing that when they click on this checkout with PayPal button, for example, it's not actually doing anything, right? We see loads of people clicking on it, but it's not resulting in the sale. So what is exactly happening over here, right? So again, now we're starting to, well, be a bit like Sherlock Holmes or something, trying to uh, see what, what's, you know, what, who's the culprit over here. And then finally, there's other, other tools like exit intent surveys. Uh, there are uh, tools that can allow you to uh, uh, put out a survey as soon as a customer starts to leave that page. And there you can ask them, What's, uh, you know, uh, did you not find what you were looking for? Uh, what um, uh, prompted you not to buy from us today? So you're asking the, the user questions. Sometimes you can get some really, really good answers from it. Uh, if it is about price, if it is about security, if it is about uh, too much information, now you're getting the answers from your users. And you're able to say, okay, but, well, if it's too much shipping, Okay, that's, um, you know, maybe one person has said that. But if loads of people are saying, we can't check out through PayPal, or our payment option is not available, maybe you guys use something quite specific in, in Norway, and PayPal is not a big thing over there, right? That's some information. Now, you can take that information and, and make it m- more actionable. But rather than just deploying it on the side and saying, yeah, you know, 10 people have said that they want a different payment option, let's give them let's give them that payment option right that's one way of doing it because you need to think of think of it this way to enable another payment option what is the actual work involved 
how much time and how much resources are you going to spend in getting a new payment option done? If it's too much information, if they say it's too much information, now you've got to rebuild the entire uh, checkout page. How long is that going to take you? Is it really the, the challenge over here, right? So now what we do is we come up with the hypothesis. A hypothesis is simply a prediction that can be verified by the outcome. And so you're saying, I believe that by adding payment option, whatever, it will increase the amount of, conver uh, amount of sales on the checkout page, or it'll increase the amount of um, uh, checkout completions um, than it is uh, currently, right? So it's basically a prediction that you're saying. So whatever your hypothesis, your hypothesis might be, um, we need to uh, add a new payment option or by having a simpler form, by offering free shipping that more customers are going to buy. So we don't know, again, we still don't know the answer to this. And all we're doing is we're investigating further and further. The first step, observing, understanding what's wrong with this page. And the second thing is saying, I believe that if I add uh, a, an extra payment option, if I make the form simpler, if I, I, if I give free shipping, that means that, will def will, that uh, element will increase my sales. It'll increase my conversions. It'll increase customer satisfaction, whatever that is. So essentially, a hypothesis uh, is a testable outcome. It can be verified by the outcome. Every uh, experiments are not just limited to web, by the way, right? Uh, or the digital world. Experimentation actually came from well, the scientific world. Uh, every uh, every discovery, every um, um, you know medicine that you have has all been through through rigorous testing and experimentation to see what works and what doesn't work. And the key thing over here that you need to remember is that you don't know what the outcome is. You simply believe that the outcome might be something and you're putting a bet, you're placing a bet and it can be verified by the outcome. So a good framework to use is this one. Uh, this is one which is, uh, I'll send you the link. Uh, it's uh, by a guy called Craig Sullivan uh, who created this framework and you um, I urge you every time uh, if you guys create experiments and hopefully you do is to start with a good hypothesis and there are different components of the hypothesis the first part is because we saw and what is the data and feedback around that so let's go back to that example and we can say because we saw uh, customers um, complaining about uh, the 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 payment options we um, and, and you know um, dropping off from the checkout page we expect that adding XYZ payment option will cause an increase in conversions and we'll measure this using whatever the metric is whether that's conversion rate or whether that is um, revenue or whatever that is. So you're essentially drawing a line in the sand and you're saying, this is how I'm, I, I, I'm putting my bet forward. I believe that we can make this change and I believe it'll, it'll cause this impact. And that's it. So that is your hypothesis. It's, it's about making a clear statement that you can look back on and say, when the results come out, that you can say, yep, now, I believe that my hypothesis was valid or it wasn't valid. So uh, the key thing over here is don't, um, b don't think that you know the outcome. Just, say, uh, just um, think that you are putting a bet and that bet might um, you know, come out good or it might fail. Right. And this is where A-B testing comes into play. So A-B testing uh, is quite a big um, thing in... Uh, is a big part of the experimentation process because it allows you to test out your uh, hypothesis in, uh, in a valid way. And the way A-B testing works is you can use different softwares out there. Uh, for, um, for you guys, uh, Google Optimize is a free option. 
Uh, Google Optimize uh, is um, currently free. There are other tools, but they're more paid. Um, and all the, all the companies out there, all e-commerce companies are using this, right? Um, so uh, KP, if you want to link to Google Optimize, that's great. Uh, but essentially what you're doing with A-B testing is you have your page, right? Now, if you're not doing experimentation the right way, or if you're uh, not experimentation minded, you might say, well, I'm just gonna change this and add that payment option, right? I'll just throw it on there and we'll see what happens. But the experimenter is saying, right, what if we put everything in a controlled environment? That means everyone coming onto the site will either go into one of these two buckets and we're going to make some changes over here, right? We're going to make uh, a, a variation as we call them. And we're going to make it with a new payment option on uh, under PayPal, which is the one that the people prefer. And so when people come onto the site, let's say a hundred people come onto the site, some of them, and they're not going to know whether they're going into the old version or they're going to go into the new version. So your testing tool will allow you to split that traffic randomly. It's randomized, so no one knows which bucket they're in. And so what you're essentially trying to do is run a scientific test with all the other variables controlled at the same time, the time of the day, uh, the, the time of the year, uh, whether there's any holidays or any, any external variables are controlled. And so the people are coming onto the site without knowing that whether they are in the old version or the new version. And essentially what you're trying to do is to figure out whether they are likely to convert, right? So are they likely, in, in this case, the conversion goal that we said was, are they likely to buy? Is this going to increase, their, uh, increase the sales or the revenue? So are they going to complete their purchase? So they come onto the site, they go into each of these different buckets. And now, when you look at your results, there's uh, a KP. I'm not, I'm not going to go into results and statistical significance on this one. I'll send some resources. That's a heavy topic on its own. But um, we, uh, we look at the results and analyze them. And the changes in the conversions tell us the story, right? Sometimes it's drastic. Sometimes it's not, there's no, no, not much difference, right? So let's say we implemented that change and the... Uh, um, uh, the version A, the, the, the original, the old version, got 20, uh, you know, um, just about 23% um, conversion or whatever. This is not the right, right one. Um, but then the other one had 50% conversions, right, out of all the visitors coming through. And you're able to say, okay, right, these are, this one's a lot higher based on the, con based on all the controlled variables you have, right? So uh, an experiment, basically, it's running in a controlled environment. Because if you make changes on the fly, if you just make changes based on what you think is, uh, is uh, right, you won't be able to know whether the improvements in your site or even a decline in your conversions or revenue is because of that change. You can't isolate the change. So in an experiment, you're isolating the changes. You're running it in this controlled environment. And uh, subjects that are coming into um, the experiment are exposed to one of the many variants are all placed in the control group. And most, most importantly, they're unaware that they're part of the results. So it makes it unbiased. And I kid you not, every one of you, if you bought online, you know, any, 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 anything online, you would have been part of an experiment at some point. Um, and there are sites that um, I think uh, there's a site that actually keeps track of, of certain experiments that they've seen. Uh, I'll link that as well. So you can see uh, what type of sites like Netflix is running, what type of uh, experiments booking.com is running. Um, Netflix, for example, uh, some of their metrics is about how to get you to watch more every time, right? So has someone like accidentally binge watched a whole box set overnight or something? It's because they're experimenting on you to get you to watch more and more. Um, there are other sites that, will, that are experimenting on you uh, to help you add more to your to your cart, like let's say you've, you've gone for to buy uh, buy uh, a single piece of clothing online, and you go to the checkout, and they've been they've been tweaking that checkout to get you to add more and more uh, into it. Again, it's based on what they want to achieve or what they want uh, to improve, and they're testing to see whether people as guinea pigs 
are able to um, you know uh, react to that one. So it's uh, all about I, testing. And I have a question. Have, for, have you spoken to the uh, to any of the people that work for either Netflix or or YouTube about the ethical uh, ramifications <laughs> of uh, optimizing so that people watch more and more and more video? Uh, so I, I know I know the guy at Netflix, but uh, Colin. But was, uh, the the thing with ethics is it's a really fine line, right? It's a really fine line when it comes to the ethics of experimentation, and it's another topic in itself. Uh, I think I can hear myself. Oh, this mic's on. Let's see if I can. Somebody's. Ah. There we go. Oh, perfect. Uh, the ethics is a big part of the of the the discussion in the industry, right? Uh, because really, what uh, you can do, you can use experimentation for good or for evil, right? Um, and if I want to uh, experiment to improve the business's revenue, I can do all sorts of things with it. Um, Ryanair, for example, uh, it's uh, if you guys are not aware of Ryanair, they're completely yes. rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> the worst airline in the world. Uh, and what they do is they do what we call dark patterns. I remember going onto the Ryanair website and um, trying to buy a ticket back in the days when I needed to buy one on their site. And uh, I reached a part where it said, do you want insurance? Um, and so the, um, I, I was looking for a simple yes, no option. But what I got was a list of countries and in that list of countries, they're not arranged in an alphabetical order, right? And do not insure me is somewhere in that list. And there's an example of a, of a company that's trying to make it harder for you to, um, to do what you want and is more interested in what it wants, which is to in, you know, raise more um, sell more insurance. And they are the and most so, profitable airline. They? Yeah, I know. Oh. <laughs> Probably that's why they're just selling insurance, right? Yeah. <laughs> People forgetting to take do not do not insure me. Uh, but this is what uh, what it is. It's uh, it's it's the culture of the company. I feel that dictates whether experimentation is used for good or for evil. Uh, experimentation on its own has no uh, you know it has no qualities of good and evil attached to it. It's the person wielding that power that. Can uh, can do it. I mean, you, it's it's um, it's the force in Star Wars, right? You can use it for good or for evil, and and you decide how to do it. Uh, in my opinion, you want to use it for good. Obviously, Netflix uh, may say um, we want to we want to keep people you know hooked in all the time and keep them binge, you know binge watching these shows all the time. Um, but you know there might be a backlash uh, at some point after which they might start optimizing for hey take a break or something right it's it's all these little things that will come into play it's it's companies will try and push the envelope as much as possible they will be trying to optimize for their interests but be if you're a customer centric company you will optimize for the for the uh, for the good of the customer right so think of it this way: there's balance, there's ethics, and you know, as I said, it's a, it's a full debate altogether. Uh, I have a podcast actually uh, called Conversion Nations. Uh, on that podcast, and on one of the episodes, we do talk about the ethics of experimentation in a, in a lot more detail. So I can I can send that to KP to send it to you guys as well. Uh, cool. Uh, so here's one of the uh, experiments I ran with one of the clients uh, a long time ago now. Um, Lavish Alice. It's a, it's an e-commerce, uh, a fa fast fashion e-commerce store in the UK. Uh, basically, this is their site. We were seeing a lot of people coming onto the site, uh, and really, uh, you know, a lot of bounce rates happening. Uh, even though up here on the on the banner it says up to sixty percent off, we're like, yeah, that should really bring in sales because that's you're running this big massive promotion, sixty percent off. Who wouldn't want it, right? Um, and so we were still seeing drop offs. So what we did first initially was to look at who were the customers coming through onto the site? Who were the people coming on to this page? What were they doing? And why they were um, leaving? So we looked at firstly a demographic research. Um, you can get some demographics from your Google Analytics report first of all. You can look at uh, locations where they are. You can look at uh, their age ranges sometimes. You can look at um, 
you know, whether they're male or female. Um, so in this side, we found most of them were between the ranges of 18 and um, I think it was 25 or something like that. Uh, female, as you can expect. Uh, and um, they were mainly around the UK. There was some Europe and stuff. So what we looked at uh, was we started asking them questions. Uh, you know, who were they? Who, uh, uh, who were they essentially? Were they students? Were they young professionals? Were they, um, what was their role in life? And second, um, you know, w whether they found what they were looking for. Most of the times they said they did find what they were looking for. And they were mainly, you know, students or young professionals. And then we, we, looked at, we looked at an experiment and we said, let's try this banner. Let's try a little ribbon on the top, right? And we said, if they're, if they're students, they will likely have, uh, in the UK, they have a, an NUS card that they can use for discounts. And certain sites give you a discount if you're a student. Uh, I don't know if there's a sim similar scheme in Norway, probably. Um, but then the other thing is, buy now, pay later, right? So this was uh, people that um, were coming onto the site, young professionals, middle of the month, they're probably you know, starting to run out of money. Uh, and so we said, you know, buy today and you can pay later. So we're trialing out a payday scheme. And I think now uh, there are some other uh, services like Klarna that try and do that as well, where you can buy something now and you can pay later. So we, we, this was pre all of that. So we're trying this out. And what we realized that this banner improved the perception of, of the discounts even further. So uh, we increased sales. I don't have the, the numbers on hand right now, but we increased sales based on that, uh, that banner. Now, here's the thing. When we ran this uh, towards the end of the month, and especially that buy now, pay later, it had no impact for, for the young professional segments. For the young professional segment, this, this banner had zero impact towards the end of the month. Why? And we, we again, hypothesize because it was probably they got paid. So the buy now, pay later didn't matter. It wasn't influencing them to take the action. So we could just have that, you know, a play in sight at that point. But in, uh, uh, around the 10th of the month, the middle of the month, we could have that little banner that says buy now, pay later. And giving people the perception that they could get this item right, right away. And then we also did some other optimizations on the actual items themselves as well, looking at stock numbers. Um, and a lot of, uh, there's, you know, it's not making it too, uh, you know, too um, greedy, but we were trying to say like these are limited stock or, you know, the, these amount of uh, items are bit left in stock. So people wanted to buy that uh, soon. So that buy now, pay later. And that also had that impact, but end of the month, not so much. Students worked, so then we, we changed the banner for students. If you're coming in as a student, you were getting served a completely different experience. So all we're doing over here is we're saying that you have one site right now, and that one site is kind of catering to everyone, right? But what you need to see is who is coming onto the site and what is the mix of people, right? Let's say uh, hypothetically, uh, you're, you're getting Norwegians and Swedes coming onto the site. Now, the, the Swedes might expect a different... I'm, I'm just talking hypothetical examples. I don't know if Swedes come to your sites, but um, you've got... Um, they, they expect a different experience altogether, right? And uh, the Norwegians will have a different experience. So if you're able to tweak and optimize and basically give people a different experience based on their demographic, based on their segment, based on their profile, it's going to help you uh, improve your metrics, improve your sales, but more than anything, improve the customer experience because you're helping the customer get from A to B, which is you know, understanding who you are, what you sell, what your value proposition is, and then um, buy from you, ultimately becoming a loyal customer. Now, as I mentioned, the changes we made over here, uh, they worked sometimes and other times they didn't work. So the experiments you run are not always going to win because at the, uh, I mentioned at the start, all you're doing is you're placing a bet on something you believe might have an impact. And at the end of the day, the experimentation process is a great leveler. It'll show you whether your um, ideas of improving are worth it in this controlled environment or not. This is not guesswork. 
it's not uh, something that you have thought of uh, randomly and decided to put it out there. You've decided to put it out there in a controlled manner, which will give you a result. That result is either successful, it's either unsuccessful, or it doesn't um, have much difference between either of them, what we call inconclusive. So you have to be uh, comfortable with the fact that experiments will fail. Any ideas you come up with, and you know, more, more than ever, experiments will fail. But here's what I'd say. Don't think of it as a failure, right? Without going and sounding too cheesy about this. Uh, a, a failed experiment is an, is an opportunity to learn why that doesn't work. So as I mentioned to you, with that buy now, pay later, we thought, yeah, that's going to work all the time. We realized that when we reran the test uh, towards the end of the month, that didn't have an impact. What does that tell us? It tells us more about the customer behavior that that little element doesn't make a difference at that time of the month for that segment of people. Maybe there's another way to move the needle for that segment at that time of the month. And it's all about that. It's all, it's all about learning from your failed experiments and what can we do with that knowledge. And so um, all you're looking for is what did you learn? So experimentation can help you increase your revenue, but it can also, in, in, in the other sense of the word, mitigate any risks and prevent you from losing money. For this example, and I, I was actually a part of a, a company a while ago, again, many years ago, we were working with them where they were going to redevelop their checkout page. This is not the same one, but they were going to redevelop their checkout page. Um, and I was brought in to optimize the site. Um, I found that this, a similar kind of layout, which is why I picked this example, a similar kind of layout was actually too cluttered and maybe having a simple simpler layout with three steps, et cetera, would be easier, uh, but I needed to run, uh, run a test. Now, in some cases, running a test is not um, as simple as running it through a testing tool. You need to get the development team involved, which is in how it works in larger companies. Um, and that's when we needed to get these guys to help us build this test. We asked them, how long is it going to take you to build a new checkout? How long will it take you to reconfigure everything um, altogether? And they said, well, it's going to take us at least about, I think it was uh, three, four weeks or something. Uh, so I asked them, how much is it going to cost you? Well, so we worked out the maths. It's going to cost this much. It's going to take out this much of time. And then we looked at our test, the test that we were going to do. How long would it take to code that test? A couple of days, right? And we run it for a couple of weeks. How, what is that going to cost? And so then we, we looked at the trade-off and we said, if we are able to run that test and if we're able to prove that um, that version is, uh, is better or worse or good or bad, we will know either way which um, version we need to put our, our effort into. Uh, we ran the test and the, the, basically the one that the, the development team was actually working on uh, came out really bad in that, in that uh, experiment. And we were able to go to the to the the C level, the boss, or the manager, or whatever, and and basically tell them, look, if you actually had gone down this route, and your development team spent two weeks and how many ever uh, dollars or pounds or whatever, in building this new version, you would have lost this much money as a result of it, right? And it it kind of puts everything into perspective because people have this opinion, right, that any uh, thing they think of. Is, is good enough. We go back, I go back to that little, um, um, little cartoon over here because that's how it works in, in a lot of uh, corporate uh, companies, a lot of uh, larger companies where it's not about data. It's about who's, um, idea, who, who's the strongest person in the room, who's the highest paid person in the room. So experimentation itself becomes a great leveler because uh, you can actually um, show the risks involved and you can mitigate those risks. Right, experimentation can help you understand if you if you need to uh, open up into a new market. Like, let's say your your business is growing and you want to expand uh, to uh, another market altogether. Experimentation can help you validate whether that market is viable or not. Uh, experimentation is going to help you to validate if your 
uh, product is good enough. And um, I don't know if you guys have come across this website before called Kickstarter. Anyone come across Kickstarter? Yes. Okay, so Kickstarter, for those who don't know, is a way for someone, like if I have an idea for a physical product, I think it's mainly physical products. Uh, let's say uh, I want to build this really, really cool gadget, right? Uh, and um, I want to put it, put it out there. Now I can go to a, to a, um, a factory wherever in China or wherever and say, I need to build 10,000 pieces and that's going to cost me 50,000 pounds, right? 50,000 pounds to build, uh, to get this whole supply, this um, factory to, uh, to build my product and then some more money to get the supply chain in place and so on and so forth. And so now I'm basically putting 100, 000, say 100,000 pounds into this new venture. And I'm excited because this, this invention is going to change the world, right? It's going to be amazing. Uh, and I put it out there uh, and then I see no one's actually buying. Actually, the reviews are really bad. People are, are, don't really like it. What's gone wrong? And so Kickstarter is a different model and it's, it's based on the idea of experimentation, right? So with Kickstarter, I can build a prototype of the item, put it out there and tell people, look, this is what I want. Uh, to build, and I want to sell this to you. Will you back me? Will Will you back me? And so they can start putting money uh, into this project, and they can say, "Yes, we want this." And what what is that? That is intent. That is customer intent to say, "Yes, we want that item." So they put money into it. You fill up. You reach your goal of of uh, securing the the funding. Now you can build the product. What have we done over there? We've mitigated the risk in one one way. Uh, going to a factory and getting them to build build um, all those products, you know, spending a lot of money, trying to hope that your customers are going to buy. Whereas in this one, we've uh, put it out there. People have decided whether they vote on it. Uh, there's an, another side that escapes me now, where they would they would come up with these smoke and mirror tests for for these these cool uh, nerdy kind of. Um, gadgets or uh, devices that they put out there. And when you, uh, and you, all they're doing is they're testing demand. The product doesn't actually exist. They're testing demand. You click on it and you're like, oh, sorry, the product is coming, still coming soon. Enter your email to, uh, for us to let you know um, when it comes out. Now, yes, you, as a customer, you might be disappointed, but what are they doing? They don't want to learn whether you're going to, uh, whether you're going to buy it right there and then. They want to learn whether you're interested in it because maybe they want to learn more about certain things. So it's all about validation. And that's where experimentation is so beautiful because you, it's not just about a website. Go beyond the website. Everything, uh, everything um, can, be, can be tested. Like we have uh, customers that test uh, their messaging on flyers. So they are, they're a charity. They, they send out different flyers. They're trying to raise money. Their flyers have different messaging, different layouts, and they're testing that to see which one has a more emotional connection with their, with their um, don uh, uh, donors uh, and which one will prompt them to take more action. There's uh, experiments in, um, uh, okay, I'm going to say a Swedish brand of here, IKEA. Uh, you know, IKEA is experimenting. Every time you walk into that store, you look on the floor, uh, I'm, I think it's a standardized experience everywhere. You look on the floor, there's a little arrow from, based on the light directing you which way to go. You basically have to go all over the place because they've engineered that for maximum um, uh, impact, right? They know that if they, if they take you a certain way, that even if you've gone for one thing, you'll end up with 10 things. Right? They could just leave it open and you could just go wherever you want, but they've engineered it in a certain way. They've engineered the... the the, the canteen, the, uh, the, the cafe in the middle. So you get the smell of the food and you kind of stop, take a break and then continue on again. So there's uh, experimenting on, on, on different things. So going back to what I said, uh, you know, when you're launching an e-commerce store, what are you doing, right? You're, you're bringing in traffic. You can be testing on, the, on, on your ads, on your ad copy, on your SEO tags to see whether that's bringing in more people, whether that's getting people to act on site, how you provide that experience of trying to get people from one place to the next, how you bring in the sales, the emails you send out to people post-purchase. You might want them to leave reviews, right? Can you optimize, can you improve your emails for them to leave reviews? 
and then retargeting ads, bringing them back in or retargeting emails to bring them back in. So experimentation, again, is, is a mindset, as I said, because you can, there's a world of opportunity out there that, that you can do. What I've shown you is a few examples of like how you can do it on, on websites because that's the, the most accessible one and it's easier to do today than it was you know, maybe 15 years ago. There's a lot of easy tools out there um, uh, that you can implement. The main thing is keeping a close eye on your customer behavior, keeping a close eye on what are they doing, how, where are they failing to meet their goals because that is the starting point. Then comes your, your, get, your hypothesis. Then comes your, uh, uh, your, your ideas on how you can improve that experience. Then you put it to the test because you say that I don't know if this will work or not, but let's see if it does. And then you put it out there and you say, right, this ribbon is going to make a difference. Let's put it out there for this segment, for this uh, type of people, for this campaign, for this audience, and we'll see if it has an impact for them. So you're improving and personalizing your experience for it. So there we go. This is uh, hopefully uh, useful to you guys as a primer. As I said, I've not gone into much technical detail on this one, uh, but I will be giving KP a lot more resources to share with you guys over the next few days. Uh, there's, a, there's a world of opportunity out there. This is an exciting part of, of the internet. It can essentially make or break businesses, right? Um, uh, companies that experiment, uh, do a lot better than ones that don't. So I hope you uh, launch companies that have an experimentation mindset. I hope you are part of companies that have an experimentation mindset because those are the ones that really kick ass. Uh, so yeah, uh, cool. KP, that's me done. Uh, if you have any questions, if you want to ask me anything, please feel free uh, or yeah. Yeah, I have uh, plenty of questions. So go for it. Do you, do you want to have a break before we go for Q and A's or uh, do, do people need a break or should we just uh, continue? Uh, one student asked me, I said, we'll continue as long as you can, uh, Manuel. <laughs> sure, uh, um, so if you have a question that you don't want to speak out, uh, you can just write it in the chat uh, or I can start asking questions. So, uh, I think a lot of students uh, are wondering, okay, can we start testing with uh, our current e-commerce store? Uh, oh yeah, for sure. How much traffic do you need to start testing? So this is where the, the challenge of testing comes into play. The, the amount of traffic that's required sometimes can be quite significant, right? Uh, so we'll, there, there's, there's, this is where it goes into statistics and, and stuff like that, uh, where you need to really define the amount of traffic comes in uh, there are schools of thought that say that say you need you know at least a thousand visitors coming onto your site uh, per week so but the statistics now nowadays are slightly different to that uh, so I will again link to film resources around those statistics because it's it, it is uh, all over the shops if, if, if anything uh, but you need you need a sizable volume for testing so a lot of the larger companies can test and can test a lot smaller companies will struggle to test because there's not uh, enough, uh, enough vi uh, variety of visitors coming through. So what you want to do is you want to be um, looking, focusing on the customer experience through these, through these other things, uh, you know, understanding your customer behavior and really tweaking based on that. Um, but yeah, the opportunity for experimentation increases with, with the increased uh, traffic that you may have. Mm -hmm. A tip for everybody for the exam is to implement Google Optimize, uh, explain what Google Optimize is and uh, visually present uh, some uh, tests that you would run if you had more traffic. Uh, that's something that everybody can do. Uh, Google Optimize is free uh, and that's also a reason why you should implement Google Tag Manager and implement Google Optimize uh, through Google Tag Manager. It, it's pretty simple. So just- I see another uh, question coming in over here as well um, yeah. from Matt. Uh, what do you think is the biggest mistake new e-commerce stores make, uh, maybe besides not testing? I can tell you the biggest mistake that they make is they use the same, they look at other e-commerce stores and they make their 
e-commerce store look exactly the same as theirs, right? So you have a you have a sea of uh, e-commerce stores that look exactly the same as the other one, and I think it, at some point in the past, you had one e-commerce store that came up with this design, and then the other said, "Oh, you know what? Our competitor is doing that one. Let's copy that." And so now you have exactly the same kind of uh, look and feel. And sometimes it's not even the same audience. It's like a different audience altogether, but it's such a uh, templated experience. It's just like a template that you put out there. So one thing, um, whilst that might be a good starting point for some businesses, what I would say is use that as a launch pad to quickly tweak your experience based on what you're learning about your customers, right? Because um, Chances are, if you're using an e-commerce store, do you guys set it up in Shopify or something? Is that yes. how are you guys setting? Yeah. Or WooCommerce. So, WooCommerce. So again, or those Shopify. guys will have templates, right? And yes. they'll have these high converting templates that they would have uh, put together from again from other sites. So you would most likely start off with with an experience that is quite uh, generic, if anything. Uh, and, but this is where the opportunity lies. You have the opportunity to go in and start looking at ways of improving it and improve it quickly so you move away from a generic experience of your customers. Great. Any other questions? Uh, I have another question. Uh, how would you describe, you mentioned growth hacking earlier. How would you describe oh. growth hacking? <laughs> Uh, my own personal opinion is growth hacking is bullshit, but <laughs> that's me. But there, there's there's a kernel of truth there. So gr the the thing the the thing with growth hacking is it makes it seem like yeah you can just do like the small thing and you get massive wins, right? So really uh, good uh, some good examples of uh, growth hacking in the past uh, is uh, Dropbox for example. Uh, so Dropbox uh, if you sign up uh, to, uh, if you this is going back many years now. If you were to sign up to it, you would uh, get some free space and then you can invite friends and then you get more free space. So they were basically hacking for uh, virality. So for them to get more people into, into to sign up for growth uh, to Dropbox. And they were seeing is if they would uh, be able to influence someone to share it with others based on that. So again, they put it as growth hacking, but I feel there's much more involved in that than just saying, hey, you know what, we have this idea, let's just put it out there and see. So the way growth hacking is positioned on, on, on online, on blogs and stuff that you read is like, hey, you know, like these cool hipster kids that have like put out these, they had this amazing idea in the middle of the night and they put it out there and then it just became viral overnight. That's usually not, not how it works. Uh, testing is a process. And this is why I kind of have an issue about growth hacking as a term, uh, because it kind of um, it kind of uh, kind of pushes out a lot of um, uh, negative uh, you know negative awareness of of testing. And so this is where like people start doing growth hacks for all sorts of things. Sometimes not so good you know negative stuff. Um, it is just just trust the process and yeah, it'll be fine. Yep. So it's just testing, basically. It is testing. It is testing, but uh, but it's made to look like uh, that you you can skip all these steps and you can you can forego thinking up a clear hypothesis and clear uh, ways of testing. And it's just like, hey, we have this idea. Let's just put it out there and and hope for virality. So mm -hmm. it's it's more about the the way it's positioned is what I have an issue with. Mm -hmm. I have some more questions. Um, okay. Um, how do you learn new topics? How do you learn new topics? How do I learn new topics, or how do you how do you learn about testing? Which one? No, how, how do you learn? So, uh, how do you learn in general? Uh, what 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 topics have you learned the most about the last three months, and how did you learn that? Uh, so basically, through uh, I'm more of a hands-on person. Uh, like even when I started in testing, for example. Uh, I, I knew about the basics on something like this, you know, like high level stuff. And then I was just, just straight in. That's me, like as a type of a learner that I am, I just go straight into doing stuff. Um, um, and then kind of tweaking and improving my knowledge along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I've been uh, kind of learning uh, some programming recently on, on a different language that um, is just a hobby that I'm kind of teaching myself at the moment. 
uh, but it's for stuff I want to do later on. Uh, and I'm teaching myself R, which is, uh, which is a, a, a language for, for statistics and stuff like that. Uh, but with that, I kind of sat in a course for, for about like 30 minutes and I was like, okay, I want to try and do something with it. Uh, so I, I, I took more of a project-based approach and, and started like playing around with some projects to see some tangible results from it. And that's the way I learn. I like to see tangible outcomes from, uh, from, my, from my learning. Um, I, I don't like uh, listening to someone talk about something for, for an hour. I know I'm being ironic here, but <laughs> you can go and put that into practice straight away. Yeah. What, what are some good resources uh, to learn more about what you've... Uh... Uh, what you've talked about so uh conversion excel uh, cxl has can a you really share your screen and just show us uh yeah hold on um i'll just need to open up a browser for that bear with me two seconds and in the meantime do you think zoom tests their user interface uh i well they've had to rapidly improve their user interface recently because of their security issues and stuff yeah uh, did you guys get zoom bombed by any chance no not yet <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Have you been um, part of a Zoom meeting where you've been? No, because uh, we've been on a on a paid account as part of our um, company, like for for a long time. So I think the people that get Zoom bombed are more like the the free accounts and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the improvements they've had to do, uh, they've had to do really rapidly. Like for example, meeting IDs are no longer displayed. Um, and so on and so forth. So tweaks have, have, have Lee, Lee, no, you got Zoom bombed. Someone got Zoom bombed over here. I think, yeah. Yes, we we did. We did get uh, Zoom bombed uh, when um, we had uh, these people from Facebook, oh, and we thought it was one of us, but it was not. I think, but it was super annoying. It like. Uh, I had such a hard time to focus. It was just, uh, oh my God, it was so embarrassing. I what could happened? die. What happened? Uh, basically, we just, uh, yeah, we just sat there and suddenly, um, I don't know, someone is just starting to say like, oh, I don't get it. I don't understand like several times. And uh, the girl from Facebook had to like explain it like three times or something, and then um, and then we just realized this is just uh, a troll, you know. Mm. And then uh, uh, suddenly there was another person in another accent, so there was more people in the same account. Mm. Um. Oh yeah, so uh, so embarrassing. Huh. Funny. <laughs> uh, right, cool. So I've got uh, CXL up over here, as you can see. Uh, there's. You have to share uh, it. They have. Uh, oh, I'm not sharing it. I can't. Oh, there we share go. It. I am sharing there it. There we now. go. Perfect. So uh, CXL, they do a lot of like these courses on uh, much more uh, deeper courses on conversion optimization, but they also have things about uh, much more uh, on analytics acquisition, growth marketing. Uh, I don't know, maybe you might be able to get some kind of deal with them at the moment, KP. Like yeah, can... I've, uh, I've uh, discussed with Pe Pep. 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 Yep. yep. So uh, you get like all access pass, but they have like lots of uh, courses on, as you can see. I... Your AB... Can you email that and then put it again? <laughs> What's that story? Somebody uh, needs to turn off their microphone. All right. Robin <laughs> Patterson. <laughs> so you can see like even with like for example like analytics and stuff you can learn a lot more uh, you know start with beginner go into much more intermediate so for people that are that are learning things you know they're getting introduced topics um dive deeper go much more deeper into it there's loads of resources on there there's there's another one on on udemy on um let's see if i can find that udemy uh on conversion optimization as well um, I can show you that. Uh, this guy done by someone I know called Ruben, uh, Ruben de Boer. Uh, so let me find that course for you and I'll put it in the link. Conversion optimization. This is free resource, isn't it? Or Udemy costs uh, a little bit. I 
think it does cost a little bit. Uh, so this one is over here, the complete conversion optimization course. Um, so I'll share these ones over here. Where's the chat? 100 or 11 pounds. That's 11.99. So is that what, 110, 112, not, mm -hmm. or something like that? I think, uh, and I'll put the CXL one over here for you guys as well. Uh, so yeah, some of the resources online are, are these ones. Um, we have, uh, if you're looking for some free uh, resources, like as I said, like uh, there's a podcast that I run called Conversion Nations. Can you drop that's the more, uh, Yeah, hold on. Actually, if you're on Spotify or if you're on, on um, iTunes, you'll have that. You can just search for Conversion Nations and you'll be able to find the podcast on there. It's easier to find it that way. Great. Uh, more questions, anybody? I think someone asked, um, uh, is there anything else we should expect about the pointers you have in your presentation? A, B, T, a, a lot more, a lot more. I mean, a, th this is just about scratching the surface, right? Um, I'm not uh, expecting you to uh, pick everything up uh, right now, this was mainly an introduction to uh, this world of experimentation. Uh, as I said, there's a lot more resources out there, which I'll send some of them to KP as well. But mm -hmm. these will will kind of help you go deeper into it. Like for example, CXL, just on its own, as I said, uh, there are courses that can help you go deeper into it. Uh, running an experimentation program, you know, you're going to have to involve people that are doing copywriting, that are doing people that are doing uh, you know there are specialists in analytics and so, so you can you can be you can you can also be specializing in certain areas so it's not just about testing on a whole but you can also specialize in certain areas within experimentation itself who, who would you who do you consider the three most uh, or the leading authorities in your field uh so pep is obviously one of them pep liar uh, is, is definitely one of them uh, the other one is a guy called Craig Sullivan, uh, who uh, I mentioned uh, wrote that um, hypothesis toolkit, but he's also one of the most experienced uh, conversion optimizers out there. Uh, you also want to look up, look at this guy called Carl Gillis. Uh, okay, I'll put some names over here, actually. I should really type these out. Um, who uh, is, a, is a Belgian guy, uh, mainly from a, from a UX side of things, but he's really, really experienced, really passionate about experimentation, uh, top guys. Uh, if you, uh, there's a few others uh, that I want to mention. Uh, the other one uh, is uh, um, Talia Wolf uh, from Israel. She's really good with uh, with um, um, the the side about messaging and and uh, and copy, uh, and and yeah, I'll, I'll uh, introduce you. You know, I'll put, put put some name downs, and hopefully you can follow them on LinkedIn. Uh, and uh, you can check them out over there as well. Uh, can you can you recommend some uh, great blog posts about this subject? That you, uh, as I said, yeah, the CXL one is is probably the most one. It's, it's quite comprehensive. So they have a they have a really comprehensive blog uh, that they've maintained over time. Uh, so you can see over here, and they've, they've got all things data driven. Uh, E-commerce personalization strategy, for example. So they they write really detailed blog posts, mm -hmm. like that you can you can you can read for for hours on end. Uh, definitely recommend these guys. Mm -hmm. Well, and because uh, all the students are required to write a lot, uh, and a lot of there's been a lot of questions about what is a good blog post. Can you uh, say a few yeah. words about what, why you consider the, uh, or what, what is a good blog post and why is it good? So uh, for the, for a good blog post is one, again, without sounding too fluffy, is one that helps the, the reader get to their goals, right? Can, can you show one? an example? Yeah, uh, I mean, so, so if, you, if we look at this one, uh, e-commerce personalization strategy, for example, uh, so someone look, uh, the reader's goals over here might want, might be about how do we personalize uh, our experimentation uh, for uh, our e-commerce side, make it much more personalized experience. Uh, with these guys, the way they've, they've gone through things is they have decided that their readers are a lot more detail uh, focused. They want actionable steps and they want to know 
uh, how to uh, put it into practice. So whenever they write their blog posts, they write really long blog posts. Uh, so they, they've kind of taken over that really long, uh, long form uh, content, you know, 10,000, 12,000 word blog post with a lot of data points. So they, they, they have a lot of uh, data that's referenced within that art article. Uh, and they've also uh, talked, um, you know, they, they spend a lot more time into researching that blog post. So heavily researched, a lot of data points, a lot of people that they, they reference within this article as well. So again, giving you step-by-step -step, uh, flows. Uh, now for, uh, for something like uh, on our blog, on the Effective Experiments blog, we take a slightly different approach. Ours is much more smaller to the point because we get people that um, are on the sea level that don't have a lot of time to read up on, on these things. And sometimes, you know, we've, we had feedback that some of the long form blog posts don't actually work for them. So we've, we've taken a different approach. It's again, it, what works for your, for your visitor. So sea level, that's executives, more, executives uh, yeah. CEOs, CTOs, Correct. marketing Correct. directors. Yeah. Correct. But here you can see these guys, you know, uh, they're quite big in the, in the practitioner space. So a lot of uh, optimizers read CXL and they're not going to want like high level stuff. They want more nitty gritty. Practical. Uh, practical. That's the one. The practical uh, information. So you've got really long blog posts. I mean, this is, uh, you know, something that can be useful to you guys as well if you look through it. But uh, it's a step by step approach that helps you uh, with that. Mm -hmm. And I also saw they had some citations in there and yeah. uh, I think they use citations uh, to get their point across, but I think also they use it strategically to get the, the people that they reference to share this blog post. Correct. Correct. That's so a sharing strategy. So yeah. some, and, and people say, oh, you know, I've been mentioned on CXL or I've been, I've written an article for CXL or they've used a piece of my research on CXL because again, it's such a trusted uh, resource within the industry mm -hmm. uh, that people want to be part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions or should I continue? Uh, people probably want to break, but I want to take advantage of the time Manuel is giving us. One question. Yeah. Most of the students have email uh, for the web shop. Could you please elaborate a bit on how to run an experiment with emails? With email, sure. So with emails, and sometimes uh, your email uh, provider will also allow you to run inbuilt experiments in the, in the platform sometimes. So if we think about email, let's break down the components, a component of an email. You've got the subject line, right? You want to show? Got, uh, I don't have any examples for email at the moment, unfortunately. Okay. So I, I won't be able to show that, but maybe I'll find some resources that might be useful to you guys. But going back to that, you have your subject line, right? You've got the, the individual components within the email itself. So the goal is what are you trying to achieve with your email, right? What can you test? You want someone to open your email. That's step one. And you want someone to, to uh, act on your email, whether that's uh, you know, use the coupon or come back to the site or whatever that is. So if you were to say, I, want, I see not a lot of people are actually opening up my email. I want them to open up my email. You might want to test your subject line. So your subject line could be, you know, you might be our, our latest products. You might be your standard one. But what if you could say uh, special offers available today, um, click, click here or something like that. And you want to see whether that's actually enabling people to open up the email more. Then the layout and the design within your actual email itself the, the body of your email is, is something that you can test. So um, uh, we use, uh, internally, we use, a uh, we use an email ser a service provider called Active Campaign, but I know a lot of um, companies out there like MailChimp, uh, et cetera, will allow you to run A-B tests off your emails. Again, so when you're sending that one email, uh, or that email test to your subscribers or, or, or customers, it splits it into two or three ways, depending on how many changes you've made. And again, the people receiving it don't know whether they're receiving one version or the other version. And that way you can test out. It's all about isolating what, what, do, you want to, what do you want to achieve, isolating certain components to test on it, 
and then running that test. That's a tip for the final exam too. If, you, if you're explaining or writing about some type of marketing activity, uh, you should uh, include a section on testing and how would you test that. So in, if, if part of your strategy is to send out an email uh, during your launch, just add a section on, okay, we, when we sent out that email, we tested the subject line. And here are the two subject lines we tested uh, and maybe show a visual uh, illustration of, of those two emails and say, and then uh, write a short analysis on this email had an open rate of uh, 50% and this one had 80%. And then uh, maybe a small or a short discussion on why you think one did better than the other. Uh, you should probably use different UTMs so you can uh, so you know which email has generated which type of response into Google Analytics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, typically your your email uh, provider uh, allows sometimes allows you to do that. Uh, it kind of does auto tagging, uh, which will allow you to see those uh, results in um, Google Analytics as as individual parameters as well. So it, again, you need to know what, what the capabilities of the solution you're using as well when running these these tests. Uh, some of them automate them, some of them don't. I've put together, I've put two links in the chat right now which uh, talk about email testing. So if you guys want to have a look at that as well. Mm -hmm. Another question. Um, you talk to a lot of companies uh, all over the world, I assume. Uh, and you talk to a lot of recruiters, maybe. People that are looking to hire people. Um, what what skills are uh, leading companies uh, looking for in in uh, in students today? So in students, I think uh, experience is, is not one that you know they can look at. But what they're looking at is do they have the the right qualities? And for some, uh, I feel like experimentation, uh, being curious is 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 a good starting point. And by being curious, I mean being willing to look at something and say, I want to know why this is the way it is and trying to be uh, trying to dig deeper and dig deeper. Uh, and that's why I, saying, uh, I said earlier, be like Sherlock Holmes, right? You, you have this challenge over here, this, this problem over here. Dig deeper and, and try and find that solution. And I think that quality is, is not, uh, you know, something that will uh, separate you from than just having experience because students are unlikely are going to have that experience. Uh, they, they look for some experience, uh, but generally they're looking for more behavioral indicators that these will be a good fit for the type of role that they're hiring for. What type of indicate? How do you measure curiosity? Well, pra practical examples and stuff. They will look for, you know, they will, they, uh, uh, I spoke to a recruiter about, not about students, but about like, junior CROs, how do they go about hiring junior CROs? And they ask for practical examples, not in the experimentation field, but just in life in general, just to get a, get a, a view of what they've done in life that highlights that curiosity element in there. Because it'll show them uh, that these might be a good fit uh, for the company to help you know, uncover some of the challenges. And sometimes it's really good having a fresh pair of eyes that comes in uh, to a business because they don't have the, uh, the baggage that, you know, everyone else has in trying to identify the challenges. So they will, they will most likely find new things, but if they're curious, they will find new things and they'll also find solutions to it as well. Mm -hmm. So having launched an e-commerce store during their schooling, is that <laughs> a question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, uh, what, uh, maybe, maybe we can take a look. I know I'm pulling this out a little bit, but uh, maybe we can take a look at one of the e-commerce stores that was posted earlier. Uh, yes. Or we can just ask people to post. If you want uh, Manuel to review your site, feel free to post it right now. We've got a few over here already. I think Vetla has posted Visual yeah. Edge Store. Uh, pull that up. Uh, yeah, sure. And uh, just uh, exp think out loud and uh, how would you evaluate if you were the if you were to give this guy a grade that leg grade or some advice what would you look for yeah so so one thing uh, i'd also do want to say is uh, whilst uh, any opinion that i have is is subjective uh, it means that it's it's an opinion 
Uh, it's not based on any data. It's not based on any anything. The site might work perfectly fine, right? So uh, it's up to you uh, to decide on that. So one of the things over here is uh, when, we, when we look for uh, on a site is the five second rule, right? Within five seconds, does it tell me what this site does? Can it uh, help me understand whether I'm in the right place or am I going to be wasting my time on the site? So it's it's about helping me understand so visual edge uh we're looking for a value proposition first right and i think uh just uh, glancing at this i think this seems to be more of a uh, more of a value proposition though slightly vague uh, and this is just stating the company name again which is already there so i think there's a bit of wasted space over there uh Bethler, if you if you want to make it a bit more um um direct as to what the value proposition of the site is. What is someone going to be doing over here? What are they going to be getting out of this? And what's better about your site uh, than anything else? I think LUTs are, I think filters or something, is that correct? Filters for camera? Yeah, for... yeah that's correct. Yeah, so if, if, I'm a, if I'm a filmmaker or a photographer, then the LUTs uh, are, uh, you know, uh, for any occasion accessible for you. It's it's vague, but you want to be thinking about what is so special about your your LUTs. Uh, you know, implement uh, LUTs uh, LUTs within within seconds or within minutes into your workflow, or something like that, which gives you gives them a better understanding about it. So, one thing you want to ask your uh, visitors is, you know, do you know what what the site does, and were you able to find what you're looking for? Because you're trying to see is were they able to understand what you're offering over here, right? Um, and so again, you've got, so here's the, the other thing. Uh, and, and I've seen this on many sites, it's vague uh, value propositions, right? And we talk about like easy to use. Uh, now, who in their right mind is gonna put hard to use on their site, right? Like, is, 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 that, is that something that you wanna brag about? It's easy to, I'm assuming it's easy to use, otherwise I wouldn't be, um, you, using it, but if if you're saying so rather than easy to use, implement it within seconds or implement it within within a, a few minutes. Okay, then then that gives me a be better way of understanding what I do. Twenty four seven support. Okay, so that's fine for all your needs. Uh, again, um, try and be a bit more specific. And where you can test out and where you can improve is when you understand you know, what type of people are coming onto your site. Are these amateur photographers? Are these much more um, dedicated, uh, be, uh, you know, semi-pro, pro? What are their, what's their line of work? Uh, are these people that are shooting uh, GoPro footage? Are these people that are shooting um, uh, you know, um, music videos or whatever? And then you can make out LUTs to transform your music videos into a, a professional package or something like that, right? And so now someone, if, they, if you're advertising to someone that's making music videos and they come onto this site and that site is actually talking to them about their, uh, about their work and you're like, oh, right, this is for me. Yeah, and, yeah that's yeah. quite clever, actually. Yeah, it, it's, it's not clever. It's, it's, it's just, you know, again, it's about thinking who is the customer, is the messaging right for them? And you do that way, right? Because and the, the, we talk, someone asked about you know what's the uh, problem about a lot of e-commerce stores? It's everyone is copying everyone else's mistakes, right? This thing about easy to use, twenty four seven support, everyone has that, right? And, and you think yeah, because they're doing it, we do it as well, and so everyone yeah. just ends up in this vicious cycle. Um, so you start off with a baseline. Be clear about your value proposition, right? Um, you know. You may also want to look at things like, are these guys price sensitive? Are they coming for the cheapest LUTs? Are they coming for uh, something that is, uh, you know, uh, something that is useful for them? Now I see over here as well, you've got some discounts going, right? Maybe that might be something you want to talk about under the top so that they don't have to scroll down and then figure it out. Because if I'm here and I don't see what I'm getting, I might leave. How can you find that out? You can look yeah, at your heat maps. Uh I gotta be honest that uh, we have been a bit lazy with um, creating the home page because all of our ads uh, just direct them directly to the product page. Okay, let's go to the product page then. Let's go straight over here. Okay, so uh, over here we've got your sale tax included. Great. Uh, you've got 
uh, buy with PayPal, more payment options preview. You've got some previews over here. Uh, so uh, one thing um, I like to, uh, you know, one thing you, you want to think about is how do you get people to information without them having to click around as much as possible, right? So one thing about your previews is uh, I've got to take an action to go into it. But what if you had that available straight away, like around here, right, in the, in the images? Again, that's something you can test out. Mm. Uh, is this box image appealing to them? Or is this image more appealing to them? Mm -hmm. Again, that's something you can say. They, might, they may like boxes, who knows, right? Uh, but if you were to put this one up, are they more likely to be like, yeah, I know what that LUT filter does now. That's exactly the one I want. Uh, you might say, yeah, here's some actual footage it's been used in. So now here's another uh, thing where you might say, does video um, actually convert better than just images? Will that help them make purchase decisions better than, um, than not, right? I, I have um, a nerdy question for you. You see that the bar across the bottom there, this website uses cookies to ensure. Uh, I see that, I, I did some research on that last year for Norwegian companies. And I, I've seen that a lot of companies have that bar across the bottom, the um, cookie bar. Yeah, but it's in Norway, it's not required to put right in your face. It's enough having a link at the bottom where it says our cookie policy. But what are the law rules in the EU current or GDPR rules? So when someone comes onto the site, uh, it's, it's horrible because it, it and it, the way it's designed is just like it, it just looks really bad. Like most of the options out there, it's like a banner across. And it's not just about saying, OK, got it or whatever you have the option of selecting which cookies you want and which cookies you don't want as well. And you mm -hmm. can accept or decline. So there's a lot more things happening on, on banners in G, uh, with the GDPR rules in the EU. Uh, so it's a lot, uh, yeah, I feel it kind of ruins the customer experience in some ways. It just makes it a bit harder uh, to, um, to navigate, uh, but it's not uh, just on like a, a banner like you guys have it. But, but if, you go, if you go into amazon.co.uk from your browser, yeah. uh, uh, will, let's see, is, see if go, go to amazon.co.uk. I will, I, will I will have more likely a cookied experience because I'll go into an incognito window to actually yeah. share that. Because um, this is an example of, uh, I think everybody's following everybody else, but I, I don't think uh, if you go to a few, uh, sites that you haven't so been this to. this one doesn't this one doesn't actually throw me anything and i i don't know why i can't see it. Uh, you have to click on it there yeah so, it doesn't show uh, you so we used yeah here we go we use cookies by using our site you can send to cookies see how so small the, that is compared yeah. to um, that's not that annoying but that's probably they're following the eu regulations there so why do people have this annoying bar across the bottom when they can just include a short small sentence about it somewhere that's not that annoying I think it's because of, of people, you know, they're, them wanting to play safe, not getting hit by fines and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, look at your, look at your uh, laws. I see why they, why they have that and stuff. But do you think uh, Amazon some, would risk getting a 3% uh, fine of all their revenue? Do you think it's legally? Uh, it, it's, it can be legally enforceable. I mean, with all that, that's happening right now, I don't think they'd want to be ch chasing people on fines. No. But, um, I know when GDPR came out and then there was this whole conversation about it, people were like, yeah, we need to, we need to start um, uh, being a bit more cautious because there were, um, there were uh, some fines given out and stuff. Okay. I have just two more questions and then we'll take a break. One is uh, what are your three best advice for students in, in uh, 2020 that uh, want to get a job in the field? Uh, get as much practical experience as you can. So really, you know, as you're doing it with your, with your project, it'll kind of expose you to all the nuances of, of, the, of the work. So uh, do as much uh, practical stuff as you can. Read up a lot on the industry. This industry is changing so rapidly. Like I've been in, uh, in this for a while now. And even like stuff that was, was kind of big two years ago, is, it's like, it's like becoming irrelevant now, you know, like AI and machine learning were this big thing two years ago. People are not talking about it as much now. Uh, so this industry kind of changes really rapidly. 
uh, and then the third one, uh, I'm trying to think of the third one, <laughs> test and observe your customers and test. I think that's, that's the key thing. So uh, learn to uh, learn about a variety of things. Uh, you know, the digital space is so uh, diverse. There's so much going on that you can learn about. As I said, we talked about experimentation today, but experimentation itself branches out into so much uh, that you can do. You can do uh, statistical analysis, you can do um, you know, copywriting, you can do design, UX design. Uh, so really there's a lot. And sometimes you, you can decide whether you want to be a jack of all trades and learn everything uh, and, and be okay at it, or you can be amazing at one thing. Uh, but the skills uh, are there. And, and as I said, with experimentation, it's about a mindset. Those skills are transferable to everything. One last thing I want to talk to you about. In, in 2011, uh, you know, I think it was Obama, uh, the Obama, was it 2011 or 2008? I can't remember now. Both 2008 and 2012. Okay, so I'll talk about the 2008 one. So there was these, the, these guys, Matt Sirocco and uh, Dan, I forget his surname now. And they were part of the Obama campaign. I think it was and what they were doing. Was it the 2012 one? Yeah. yeah. So they, they were doing, uh, they were part of the Obama campaign and they were basically optimizing the voter experience, not the voting machines. That's what Trump is doing, but um, the, the uh, voting experience on the website. So people donating money to the Obama campaign or people uh, understanding that, he, you know, they want to vote for him and stuff. And they were, they were using messaging. They were using omnichannel. They were using a TV ads. They were using uh, the, the websites and uh, phone calls and all sorts of different channels to test and optimize their message. So if, uh, you know, I think we need some optimizers to help elect new people. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that's, um, you know, experimentation happens in, in every aspect of life, uh, in every aspect of business. Uh, you will do well if you focus on, on focusing on the needs of your target audience, your customers, your subscribers, or visitors, and then improving their lives. And that'll have a good impact on you as well. I think yeah. Yeah, if you yeah. want to learn more about the, that, you should uh, watch the Netflix movie, The Great Hack. If you haven't watched it, it explains what they did and what people, what the po possibilities are in uh, manipulating or uh, yeah, making people do what you want them to do. Yeah, those are the, that's the dark side of experimentation, right? Yes. <laughs> so. uh, the final question is, I always ask people that share their time and experience, is how can we help you? Uh, don't do shitty experimentation. <laughs> don't do growth hacks is, is one way I'd say. But that's how you can help because I'm, I'm here to spread the word. You know, as I said, I'm, I'm happy to give my time. Uh, happy to be here. Um, so thank you for inviting me. Uh, I don't need anything per se. Uh, I wish you all the best. Uh, and as I say, uh, in terms of uh, your work, uh, just make sure that, you know, as you go out in the world and, you know, start doing your own stuff, uh, that you really focus on 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 the right way of doing things. Uh, I think that'll be that'll do me well. So yeah, thanks. Great, thank you very much. Uh, can you just pull up your LinkedIn profile, uh, or I'll pull I'll pull up your LinkedIn profile, and okay, then yeah, sure. um, then people can. I hope it's okay if uh, people add you. Um, yeah, that's totally fine. Uh, and also, if if you liked, uh, if you enjoyed the, the, these one and a half hours. Uh, feel free to send Manuel uh, some feedback, uh, a thank you note or something else. Uh, but feel free to connect. And yeah, yeah. and uh, Manuel also hosts or uh, helps uh, host some uh, events. So when, when events uh, get going again, uh, feel free to, in the future, when you get a job, uh, keep connected or, with Manuel. A good yeah. guy. Great. Thanks Thank you lot, very guys. much. All the best with your with your website, with your course, and and all the best for your future. Take yeah. care. Thank and, you. Yeah, and we'll take a ten minute break, uh, and then we'll uh, wrap up. Um, Thank you very much, Manuel. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye, KB. See ya. Bye bye. bye. Da tar vi ti minutter, så begynner vi en kvart over. Skru opp takket da da. Ja, og så inn sånn, og så share. 
Da skal jeg gi noen råd til eksamen. Og det, det er ikke så veldig vanskelig råd. Men det er jo en del regler. Følg eksamensreglementet. Det, det er jo viktig. Og så Anders, du kan jo supplere hvis det er noe... For det har vært ofte, så det, vi har jo hatt noen diskusjoner om det også, dette her med antal ord og format og alt sånn. Det er viktig å følge eksamensreglementet. For det er noen som er veldig opptatt av det. Det andre rådet er bruk pyramideprinsippet. Utropstegn, utropstegn, og dette her er jo med store bokstaver. Og så tenk selv. Det er mine tre enkle råd til eksamen, men også, men også generelt i arbeidslivet. Så når dere skriver et blogginnlegg, så er det lurt å ha med noen egne refleksjoner. Anders, har du noen flere, eller? Det er jo egentlig les oppgaven nøye, mm. så sørg for at du svarer på oppgaven. For det er det sensor ser etter. Og så kan du gjøre litt sånn som Emeline fortalte at hun gjorde, var veldig nøye med å lese det. Eller så kan det fungere noen ganger at du gjør deg selv litt frihet, men forteller deg veldig god for en veldig fin rød tråd, så du viser kompetansen din. Men da må du, være, da må du virkelig være trygg på at det du gjør er bra. Mm. Og så er læringen mye viktigere enn karakteren. Så ikke fokuser så mye på karakterer. Ikke la karakterer komme i veien for læring. Det dere skal gjøre nå, det er jo å lære masse om digital markedsføring, som gjør at dere får jobb. Så fokuser på læringen mer enn på karakterene. Mm. Det er, også, jeg har jo sagt det tidligere, men jeg kan jo gjenta det. Den, de, de som leverte den brisen shop, de var ikke nødvendig, oppgaven var, ikke, var liksom ikke nødvendigvis 100 prosent eh, korrekt eller bra, men det var helheten som telte. Så, så det er fullt mulig å få A selv om du ikke gjør alt 100 prosent. Så det, er ikke, det kan hende at man skal prioritere litt også. Men, men så har du den andre siden med Emeline og et par andre som liksom vil svare på alle deloppgavene så, så bra som mulig. Jeg vet at det er kanskje ikke det er litt diffust, en litt diffus anbefaling. Og så blir det sånn på eksamen at det er KP som leser og vurderer de fire første spørsmålene. Og så er det jeg som leser og vurderer de siste spørsmålene. Og så vil vi selvsagt snakke litt sammen og koordinere oss. Men da har dere noen tips da til hvordan dere skal gjøre. I hvert fall KP i sin del. Mm. Og så refleksjonsnotatet. Hvilken del er det igjen? Er det... Spørsmål fire. Ja, det er jo... Hvis du, hvis du skriver et bra refleksjonsnotat som er interessant og bygget på pyramideprinsipp og alt sånn, så øker sjansen for at folk har lyst til å lese resten av oppgaven også. Så akkurat som overskrift og ingress avgjør om folk leser et blogginnlegg, så, så tror jeg i fjor så var det veldig mange som jeg så at det brukte, liksom, brukte minimalt med tid på refleksjonsnotatet og bare skrev noen, bare jotta ned noen notater på det der. De, jeg, jeg vil anbefale dere å bruke, eller skrive et, et veldig bra refleksjonsnotat. Erfaringen fra i fjor var jo at refleksjonsnotatet var det som skilte på karakterene. De fleste mm. klarte å sette opp en nettbutikk med en brukbar funksjonalitet, mm. og møtte på en måte læringsmålene i den delen. Men det som skilte det var jo om folk klarte å beskrive det de hadde gjort og hvordan de hadde tenkt. Mm. Det var refleksjonsnotatet som, som faktisk skilte mellom de gode og de dårlige oppgavene. Og det var jo også noe Manuel eh, sa. Han sa jo det at eh, du, må, du må grave litt, dig deeper. Så det å grave og stille oppfølgingsspørsmål. Når man, når man hører for eksempel eh, Manuel si at growth hacking is bullshit, så, så, så må dere ikke stole, dere må ikke ta det som god fisk. Eh, og akkurat som hvis jeg sier at eh, growth hacking er eh, det viktigste i hele verden, så, så må ikke dere ta, dere må danne deres egen eh, mening om det tema. Så grav dypere. Nå skal jeg bare ta, nå, nå kommer det en del spørsmål. 
Eh, og jeg er jo veldig nysgjerrig på, tilba- eller på hva dere mener om både... Jeg, det har jo vært et interessant... Jeg synes i hvert fall det har vært en interessant opplevelse å kjøre alt via Zoom. Og jeg er veldig interessert i hva dere mener om både hvordan den, den delen av kurset som jeg har hatt, eh, men også innholdet og... Jeg er interessert i å få tilbakemeldinger, og jeg er interessert i å få ekstremt ærlige tilbakemeldinger. Eh, og da pleier jeg å dra fram, for å unngå at folk liksom bare sier «ja, dette var bra», eh, så drar jeg fram Bianca sitt eh, blogginnlegg, som også ble en kampanjeartikkel, hvor hun egentlig slaktet alt det eh, vi hadde gjort. Eh, hun var dønn ærlig om hva hun mente om undervisningen, Og, og det vi er gjerne at vi skal ha i bakhoden når jeg stiller disse spørsmålene. Jeg kommer også til, jeg kommer også til å sende ut en mail til alle sammen, hvor, sånn at dere kan få bedre tid til å skrive tilbakemeldinger. Så det jeg gjør nå i dag, det er bare for å få raske tilbakemeldinger, og så kan dere bruke litt mer tid på dybde tilbakemeldinger når dere får mail av meg. Så først så tar vi en liten quiz. Så si fra når alle er på. Skal vi se her. Vi, jeg tror vi venter på... Venter på i hvert fall 30-35 stykker. Jeg burde kanskje sagt fra på forhånd at vi kjører quiz. Venter på et par til. To til, kom igjen. Er det god kaffe? Er det to til som kom på, eller må vi kjøre med 33? Da kjører vi på. Hva står forkortelsen OKR for? Nå husker jeg ikke helt om det. Oi, sånn. Ja, da vi, det, dette er jo noe vi har hatt fokus på hele veien, og dette var hele quizzen. Jeg er glad at alle har fått med seg hva OKR står for, for hadde ikke alle fått med seg det, så hadde, ja, da hadde jeg vært skuffet. Men det er jo litt at poenget at det er ikke veldig mye av det vi har snakket om er ikke veldig komplekst. Og det er ikke så veldig mange lure spørsmål. Dette her, hele eksamen her, er ikke noe som, dere, som bare har noe betydning for skolegangen. Det er noe som er veldig relevant for det som er overordnet mål for klassen. Og de som ikke har fått med seg det enda, så skal jeg gjenta det. Gjøre studentene meget attraktive på arbeidsmarkedet. Nå håper jeg dere har fått, vi har hatt masse gjesteforelesere som egentlig bygger opp om det samme. Og så skal jeg stille en del spørsmål om disse key resultsene også. Har du blitt kontakt, eller da kan du svare ja eller nei på disse her. Har du blitt kontaktet av et firma i forbindelse med klassen? Har du vært med å lage en god nettbutikk? Har du publisert minst en artikkel du er stolt av? Har du en LinkedIn-profil i toppklassen? Og dette her er tidligere år, så har det vært mye høyere her, men jeg skjønner jo at det er, det er litt annerledes i år. Eh, både fordi, eller fordi arbeidsmarkedet er, er ganske annerledes akkurat nå. Eh, 
Men tidigare år så har det varit eh, väldigt många då plejer att fråga vem er det som har blivit kontaktet och hvor många så jag vet ikke om de som har svart eh, ja på den här. Eh, det är er jo någon som har det er fire stycker. Är er det någon som har lust att kommentera på det? Är er det någon som har lust att dela lite om vem som har kontaktat dem och det är er fyra av 29 eller av 33? Og jeg sa jo at 40, målet var jo at 40 procent av alle de som eh, dukket upp eh, i alle klassene skulle bli kontaktet. Men det er veldig interessant hvis noen, kan, eh, noen som har svart ja, som kan bare snakke litt grann om det. Er det noen som har lyst til å dele? Nei. Eventuelt så kan du bare sende mig en melding på LinkedIn og si hvem dere har blitt kontaktet av og alt sånt. Jeg er i hvert fall veldig nysgjerrig. Hvert år så pleier det å være en eller to som har blitt kontaktet av veldig mange. Da går vi videre. Men det er jo fint at så mange har vært med å lansere eller lage en god nettbutikk. Det er, noen grupper, det er jo noen som har skilt seg ut veldig, og så er det, men alle har i hvert fall hatt muligheten. Uh, og så er det mange som har publicerat en artikel jeg har solgt av og så er det väldigt mange som har en LinkedIn-profil i toppklassen, så det er jo bra Tom Robin skriver oh, ja. i chatten ja, hva skriver han? jeg har blitt kontaktet av Celsius hjelper litt til med markedsføring ikke noe spesielt, men jeg synes det er kult så gøy jeg regner med at uh, etter hvert som dere lanserer nettbutikker og hvis noen av dere får pressomtale så, så kommer folk til å kontakte dere. Og det er som også Manuel sa, at hvis man kommer på et jobbintervju og snakker i detalj om hvordan man satt opp en nettbutikk med, med testverktøy og Google Analytics og produkter og alle problemene man har haft, så tror jeg det teller ekstremt høyt når man først kommer i et jobbintervju, men også hvis man, hvis man blir kontaktet. Jeg tror hvis man deler, sånn som var det Magnus og de som delte processen med å, det, å lage en nettbutikk, så tror jeg det også teller positivt. Det er om å gjøre å bare få det foran øynene på folk som eh, søker etter folk. Dette er også ganske viktig hvordan du... Nå, nå, er, nå har man jo sett på hvordan tidligere studenter har lagt inn arbeid, og en del av dere som har lagt inn arbeid nå. Eh, der var det veldig nyttig for mig med de videoene om hvordan dere lærer. Se jeg med en gang hvem som har lagt mye arbeid og hvem som har lagt lite arbeid. Så, og det er ikke noe konkurranse, det er jo egentlig hvordan du vurderer ditt eget arbeid som er viktig. Og at du er, er fornøyd med dig selv. For det er veldig mange som eh, driver og konkurrerer med alle andre, men det er jo det at man har en god følelse selv, det er det aller viktigste. Så jeg ser at mange har jobbet hardt med bloggen, eh, og det er noen, mange som har skrevet en del innlegg. I fjor så var det jo færre, fordi da var det ikke obligatorisk. Men det å gjøre det obligatorisk, det tror jeg er noe av det smarteste vi har gjort. For det tvinger folk over, tvinger folk til å levere. Og det i senere i arbeidslivet så er det ikke så veldig mye som blir obligatorisk. Men da er det viktig å gjøre ting fordi man har lyst. Og fordi, ja det er jo, kreves jo litt når man skal, hvis man skal gjøre det bra. Det er jo ikke obligatorisk å ha jobb en gang. Nei, det er ikke det. For, for en arbeidsgiver, så er du interessert, så må du være der og bidra. Og hvis ja. du ikke vil være med å bidra, så slipper du å jobbe der, da. Mm. Jeg har skrevet minst et innlegg av høy kvalitet. Det er altså bra. Så da blir det jo mye gøyere å lese. Jeg har lært mye. Det er noen som ikke har lært så mye, og så er det mange som har lært veldig mye. Så det er jo bra. Så går vi videre. Hva er tema på ditt beste blogginnlegg? Skriv gjerne et nøyaktig titel også. Nei, det kommer senere, tror jeg. Hva er tema først? Jeg vet ikke om folk svarer OKR, fordi det er det raskeste å skrive på mobilen. Men jeg vet... Jeg vet at Fredrik har skrevet om Pirate Metrics, så jeg vet at det er dig. Så det er godt at du er fornøyd med det. Facebook Pixel. Jeg vet at jeg har lest et innlegg om personlig merkevarebygging også. Jeg husker ikke helt hvem, men... Bra. Gå videre. 
Har du delt noen av innleggene dine på LinkedIn? Det håper jeg at mange svarer ja på. Jeg håper og jeg har i hvert fall blitt tagget på mange innlegg som vi har likt, og noen få har vi delt videre. Ja. Der er det i hvert fall sånn at hvis du har tagget meg, og jeg ser at du er student, så liker jeg det alltid. Hvis jeg deler det, så betyr det at jeg synes innlegget er såpass bra at det er verdt å dele. Det er mange innlegg som jeg ikke har delt, men det kan være ikke nødvendigvis fordi jeg har lest, eller det kan hende at jeg ikke har lest hele innlegget. Men hvis du har skrevet en bra overskrift og en bra ingress, så er det stor sjanse for at jeg har lest det. Og hvis det er bra da, så deler jeg det. Jeg vet ikke hvordan du gjør det, Anders. Deler du alt, eller...? Jeg liker alt som jeg er nevnt på, og som jeg ser tilhører DIG 2103. Og så har jeg bare delt noen få, få innlegg. Men det hender at jeg kommenterer litt på det. Har du tatt, eller har du fullført Facebook Blueprint? Det er også veldig positivt når du skal i en jobbsøkeprosess. Det er også lurt å legge inn lenke til det på LinkedIn-profilen din. Det er mange flere som har tatt Blueprint i år, så jeg synes dere har gjort en god jobb. Ja. Jeg spurte jo de som presenterte fra Facebook i fjor, hvor mange av teamet deres i Facebook har tatt Facebook Blueprint, og da var det, da tror jeg det var en i det norske teamet som hadde tatt Facebook Blueprint. Så det sier jo litt om muligheten til å skille seg litt ut i arbeidsmarkedet. Og dette er en etterspurt kompetanse. Så hvis dere skal arrangere sertifiseringene, så tror jeg kanskje jeg hadde hatt den ene Facebook-sertifiseringen øverst på LinkedIn-profilen av de sertifiseringene. Skriv URL til ditt teams nettbutikk. Nå har jeg jo det, men skriv det inn, for da vet jeg hvem av dere som er med til siste slutt i min del. Q-Chit Kids er lansert, og det er et par andre som har lansert. Utrolig gøy. Jeg synes i hvert fall dere har fått til, alle de som er igjen nå, har fått til mer enn det studentene klarte i fjor. Jeg vet ikke om du er enig i det, Anders. Jeg har sett mye bra aktivitet i år. Nå er det jo sånn at dere husker jo sannsynligvis deres egen, deres team OKR. Men her må dere bare fylle ut hvordan dere ligger an på deres OKR. På KR 1, 2 og 3. Kommer dere i mål, eller er det helt urealistisk? Noen som ikke kommer i mål, så er det... Og her er det jo sånn at hvis vi ligger i snitt på syv her, så betyr det at vi har satt ambisiøse mål, fordi... Hvis alle hadde svart ti her, så hadde antageligvis vi satt alt for lite ambisiøse mål. Og der har jeg også sett at mange av dere har jo justert underveis og satt enda høyere mål. Og det er jo noe av poenget, at dere skal sette ambisiøse mål for dere selv. Og i starten så var det sånn at folk satt veldig lave mål, og så har dere justert. Og det synes jeg er bra. Så, og nå er det jo en stund igjen. Jeg vet ikke helt tidsrammen, Anders, om når er det dette her må være, når er det OKR-perioden avsluttes, er det... Det er egentlig etter den perioden. Så vi har jo ikke vært supertydelige på det, men vi har jo tenkt at nettbutikk er dine forelesninger, og så går vi over i digital markedsføring i mine forelesninger, og så er det litt overlapp mellom disse to, og litt tema som kommer igjen. Men egentlig så var det jo da 26. mai begynner vi jo på en ny Nytt sett. Ja. Kult. 
Ja, den har jeg stilt spørsmål om før da. Har du blitt kontaktet av en bedrift? Der var det fire stykker, tror jeg, som svarte ja. Så vi håper jo at etter hvert som semesteret går og ting kommer tilbake til hverdagen, så tror jeg dette her kommer til å endre seg. Og det handler jo også om at hvis dere deler mye på LinkedIn, så er det sånn at selv om dere føler at dere ikke har noe stort nettverk i dag, så har dere et nettverk. Tidligere så har jeg sett foreldre som liker ting, og det var en mor i fjor eller forfjor som sa bare, vet du hva, dette her er så bra, nå kan jeg endelig se hva datteren eller sønnen min lærer på skolen. Og mange av dere har foreldre som jobber i jobber som, ja, dere har jo foreldre som jobber, og når de deler det i sitt nettverk, så er jo det verdifullt for dere også. Det har vært ordentlig gøy å se på når dere har delt ting på LinkedIn. Og jeg liker det, så ser jeg jo hvem andre som liker det, og ofte så ser jeg ting som jeg mistenker er foreldre, og ja, ordentlig gøy. Og det er sånn, dere kan faktisk ta kontakt med moren eller faren deres og si, du skal like det jeg deler på LinkedIn, du skal dele det, fordi jeg vil at du skal gjøre det. Og hvis dere gjør det, så vil dere se at det plutselig så blir dere kontaktet, eller plutselig så blir det heiet fram av venner av foreldre, og venner og slekt. Samme, og det er jo litt av erfaring med nettbutikker også, når vi gikk gjennom det Harry's case, så de lanserte jo nettbutikken til venner og kjente. Og det er litt kleint av og til å si at man blogger, men ikke kall det blogg, da kall det personlig merkevarebygging eller en artikkel. Si at dere har skrevet en fagartikkel. Og hvis dere synes det er vanskelig å dele et blogginnlegg, ta og publiser innleggene på LinkedIn-profilen deres som en del av LinkedIn Publish. Og da er det oppfattes det plutselig veldig, da skjønner foreldre at dette her er jo LinkedIn-profilen til datteren min eller sønnen min, at da er det enda lettere å like eller kanskje dele. Vil du anbefale andre å ta DIG 2103? Og da kan dere ha i minne at hun Bianca som skrev det innlegget om den jævla bloggen, hun er den som har gitt mest direkte og bra tilbakemelding. Så hun fikk også jobb på grunn av denne klassen. Så det er jo gøy alt. Så hun gikk fra egentlig å være en sånn skikkelig, hun hatet det til å skjønne verdien av det. Og det er kanskje de mest verdifulle kundene, det er de som har vært kjempemissfornøyd, men som har snudd. Har du lyst til å holde gjesteforelesning neste år? Skal folk dele det? Det kommer ikke opp, så det kommer hemmelig til meg. Ok. Så bare skriv en e-post forresten din, og hvilket tema. Og det som var morsomt da var jo at alle de som gikk her i fjor, som skrev inn noe her, alle de har dere faktisk hørt fra. Men det var før jeg sjekket hvem som hadde svart at de hadde lyst. Da tror jeg ikke det kommer opp her. Hva bør gjøres annerledes neste år? Og her kan dere svare raskt nå. Men her kommer dere til å få en e-mail hvor dere kan hjelpe oss enda mer senere. Og dette er da først og fremst i KPS en del. Ja. Og her tror jeg det kommer opp når dere svarer. Men svar gjerne kort først, og så kan dere gjerne utdype når jeg sender mail. Den første er helt færre, men lengre blogginnlegg. Den er... Den er jeg helt enig i. Det var jo litt sånn... Litt i siste liten at vi bestemte oss for at vi skulle få obligatorisk blogginnlegg hver uke. Og det var fordi studentassistentene mente at det var veldig nyttig. Så jeg vet ikke om dere hater de eller elsker de for det. Google litt. Google. 
Det er, det er en kommentar som kommer egentlig hvert år når man har googlet at men det er faktisk sånn det er i arbeidslivet også. Så den vi ser her mer eksamen, mindre CV-gjennomgang den mindre LinkedIn Forelesning om nettbutikk til første, ja. Skal vi se om jeg kan. Der er pausen, ja. Mindre blogginnlegg. Litt grunnigere gjennomgang av hva som bør gjøres med nettbutikk til hvilken tid. Der er jeg delvis enig og delvis uenig, fordi det er jo litt av poenget er at man skal bli møtt med litt kaos når man begynner. Så, og det er frustrerende, men tidligere år så har folk oppgitt det som noe av det viktigste læringen, det er at de måtte finne ut av ting selv. Oi. Mer struktur, mindre press, ja. Mer konkret hjelp fra lærer. Uh, ja. Hvis noen har lyst til å utdype den litt. Uh, er, det, er det mer sånn spørsmål og svar? Um, færre gjesteforelesere, ja. Det er, uh, det er litt sånn egoistisk for meg. Det er ikke fordi jeg uh, ikke synes det er gøy å prate, men uh, det er fordi da lærer jeg mest. Og det er en av grunnen til at jeg klarer å holde meg oppdatert, det er fordi jeg bruker klassen til å få inn sånne som manuell og få inn en del folk, fordi de er mer oppdaterte på eh, ekspert eller mer i dybden på de ulike temaene. Før så var jeg veldig i dybden, og jeg, er, jeg kan komme i dybden, men det tar gjerne en, en til to måneder for meg å sette meg skikkelig inn i et tema. Så det tema som jeg eh, kunne snakket mye mer om akkurat nå, det er jo OKR og, og erfaringer rundt det. Det er mitt dybdetema. Men jeg har vært, men ja. Mer pensum. Da tror jeg man må gå i andre klasser, fordi sånn som Manuel og egentlig alle gjesteforelesere har sagt, at uh, ting utvikler seg så fort. Og det sier jo også de fra Facebook, at uh, hvis du ikke har jobbet med Facebook-annonsering de siste 90 dagene, så er du utdatert. Uh, det står ikke noe om, jeg tror ikke det står mye om Facebook som er relevant i pensum i dag, fordi bøker, de har en tendens til å ta et par år og komme ut. Så... Uh, i pensum så har du mye av markedsføringsprinsippene, men alle de verktøyene som vi snakker om og alt, det er vanskelig å finne pensummateriale på, på det som folk jobber med i dag. Og så kommer det mer pensum i neste del. Ja. Så pensum, det, ja, det er mye som er interessant i pensum. Mindre fokus på kvantitet. Jeg skal se hva det sto der. Det gjelder hele, jeg er litt usikker på, da er det interessant å vite hva er det, hva er det, hvordan er det man bestemmer kvalitet? Det har jeg spurt en del lærere om også, men litt sånn. Nå har jeg lært en ny ting her, hvordan fjerner man den? Sånn. Mer eksamensrelevant i undervisningen. Eh, mindre eksamen, mer nettverking. Det er jo vanskelig å tilfredsstille alle. Er det noen som har noe flere? Dere får muligheten til å gi, eh, eller til å være med å påvirke hvordan eh, dette blir neste år for eh, neste års studenter. Så håper jeg mange av dere har sagt at dere vil være med å holde gjesteforelesning. Kanskje vi skal ha en uh, gjesteforelesning om hvordan kurset burde legges opp neste år. Det kan vi kanskje ha i forberedelsen. Da. Ja. Takk for meg. Vi skal se om det er noe mer her. Jeg tror, ja, spørsmål. Og så tror jeg, ja. Hvis det er noen som har noen spørsmål. Uh, når det gjelder support, så har jo jeg... Det dere kan ta med dere også er at det jeg har gjort for dere når det gjelder Shopify, Uh, det er typisk, hvis, hvis jeg hadde vært en leverandør, uh, så er det jo, jeg sa jo ganske tydelig at jeg vil gjerne ha spørsmål angående nettbutikker gjennom LinkedIn. 
Eh, fordi da er det lettere for mig, når dere, når, når det har gått 3-4 år, eh, og dere er i jobb, så er det mye lettere for mig å, å trekke tilbake hvem som stilte spørsmål, og hvordan jeg hjalp folk. Og da er det jo interessant at jeg har fått veldig mange henvendelser på Canvas, på Facebook, på to forskjellige e-postadresser. Eh, og det er, det er ikke så nøye egentlig hvor jeg har fått spørsmål, men det er jo et viktig poeng. Hvis dere ser tilbake i opptakene, så sa jeg ganske tydelig at jeg vil ha spørsmål via LinkedIn. Så kan vi fortsette å ta kontakt med dig i forhold til nettbutikken? Ja, det kan dere gjerne gjøre. Det er fakturerbar timpris, det er 1100 kroner. Nei da. Men det er bare å ta kontakt. Men hvis dere jobber hardt med det, så, er det, så svarer jeg mye fortere. Det er en del spørsmål fra folk som jeg ikke har liksom sett noe til i, i klasse eller på Zoom, eller som jeg har sett, det er veldig mye vi av, vil du fortsatt at spørsmål til deg skal komme via WeChat? Det var et godt poeng. Jeg sa, det sa jeg i den forelesningen, men der var det jo en interessant greie at det var jo nesten ingen som kom seg på WeChat. Så de som sender spørsmål via, via WeChat, de skal jeg svare på veldig fort. Um, hvis jeg husker uh, men det var jo en av de læringspoengene at uh, det er litt rart at verden en av de mest populære tjenestene i Kina uh, gjør det vanskelig for folk å komme inn men bare ta kontakt via, jeg svarer på alle spørsmål men jeg tror jeg svarer raskest på LinkedIn der svarer jeg med en gang jeg får spørsmål nesten og WeChat en uh, Ja, jeg er på WeChat av og til, men det er ingen spørsmål som har kommet inn der. Skal OKR oppdateres frem til eksamensinnlevering 19. juni? OKR er jo et verktøy som jeg håper dere tar med dere ut i arbeidslivet. Eh, og ikke bare i arbeidslivet, men også i arbeidet med studentoppgaver. Så det, absolutt. Eh, jeg anbefaler dere å oppdatere det frem. Jeg anbefaler dere å sette nye OKR for gruppe gruppen deres. Jeg anbefaler dere å sette regler for fremtidige grupper og sette tydelige mål. Jeg tror det er en effektiv måte å komme på de riktige teamene og jobbe godt i grupper og få bedre resultater. Eh, kunne det være noe å starte en gruppe med folk? Der har jeg vurdert om jeg skal... Det er en LinkedIn-gruppe, men eh, jeg har vært litt usikker på om det er nyttig å være i en LinkedIn-gruppe eh, med tidligere studenter. Men jeg tror faktisk det er en ting vi skal gjøre, at det er en LinkedIn-gruppe som heter, skal vi se her, Digg2100. Den er ikke jeg med i. Nei, jeg promoterte den for et par år siden, og den kan det være en god idé, og kanskje det er den gruppen man skal liksom, for når dere skal ut i jobb, så er det jo veldig interessant å vite hvor tidligere Digg-studenter jobber. Så den gruppen kan dere egentlig melde dere inn i, og så kan vi se om... For tid, jeg har også vurdert om alle skal inn i samme Facebook-gruppe, men det gjør det litt vanskelig. Da tror jeg folk er litt redde for å stille spørsmål. Men den LinkedIn-gruppen, den tror jeg det er nyttig at alle blir med i. Jeg husker ikke hvem som var med i den gruppen. Jeg tror det var 2016. Vi har jo også testet ut Reddit-sider, men den, den har vi heller aldri, den har vi ikke fått. Se her, ja, nå kan jeg... Ja, Fredrik, Anders, Vettle. Så jeg tror, Anders, at vi skal fortsette å bruke denne her, bare sånn at folk kan se hvem som er i, i klassen. Og så er det jo, det, fordi det jeg opplevde nå er jo at hvis man lurer på hvor studenter som har gått klassen tidligere befinner seg nå, så har jeg... Så har det, det er den måten jeg har funnet ut om folk har vært i klassen tidligere. Det har vært å egentlig bare søke etter navnet. Så hvis jeg søker etter Fredrik Rørstad nå, og stammen.no, så kan jeg se at han har gått i klassen. Så det, det er den måten, men jeg tror det er lettere å holde oversikten når folk er i den gruppa her på LinkedIn. Ja, da bør du nesten publisere det i disse Digg2102 Facebook-gruppa, Digg2103 Facebook-gruppa, så folk er ja. klar over det. Ja, det kan jeg gjøre. Det tar vi etter forelesning. Ja, 
hvis det har kommet flere spørsmål. Uh, ja, nå glemte jeg faktisk den... Uh, uh, det, jeg hadde en ting som jeg glemte, og det sier litt om min struktur. Uh, dette her med uh, karriererammeverk, uh, det er jo noe som heter T-shape, hvis du... Hvis du spør disse som driver med CRO og leser mye på CXL, så er det noe som heter T-shape, digital markedsfører. Der har vi laget et rammeverk som er basert på, det er en fornorsket version av en del andre rammeverk. Og så er det ikke helt i henhold til pyramideprinsippet, men det, det vi bruker i Nevo, vi har ikke kommet skikkelig i gang med det, men det vi har laget, ja, det er et rammeverk som jeg kan dele også med dere. Da er det sånn at jeg har låst den første, det er rammeverket. Og så kan dette her forbedres, og Anders har antageligvis masse forbedringstips knyttet til dette rammeverket. Men vi har prøvd å finne ut, ok, hvordan er det man skal vite hva folk er gode på, hva de har lyst til å lære mer om. Så det vi har gjort, ja, det er å lage en, hva er det som skal til? Det er T-shape, det står for at du skal ha, sånn som Manuel, jeg tror han nevnte det, at du må ha litt breddekunnskap, men du må også ha dybdekunnskap. Fordi hvis du lærer deg mye om en ting, så er det lettere å forstå hvordan den tingen passer inn i bredden av alt det du trenger å vite om digital markedsføring. Så det er jo noen ting som er grunnleggende, det er jo dette her med holdninger, kommunikasjon. Det at man lærer seg litt om pyramideprinsippet, det at man det å dukke opp i, i klassen, det å være aktiv, det å stille spørsmål, det å, å være tydelig på kommunikasjon, det er jo noe som er grunnleggende innenfor alle, alle stillinger. Og så er det dette med metodikk, dette med å forstå hva sprint er, og det å forstå traction, det å forstå pyramideprinsippet. Det er ganske viktig. Og så er det dette med organisasjonspsykologi. Det er jo et, alle disse temaene er jo bre, brede eh, temaer. Men når jeg snakker om organisasjonspsykologi, så handler det om å liksom finne ut hvordan er det man, når man begynner i ny jobb, hvordan er det man skal raskt få oversikt over firma, hvordan skal man lære seg hvordan man får ting gjort i dette firma, hvordan, er det, hva, hvordan skal man opptre for å, å bli hørt i en organisasjon, Eh, presentasjonsteknikk, hvordan er det man presenterer? Da er det jo med dette med den videoen som dere lagde med hvordan dere lærer. Ja, hvordan er det dere, de som har gjort en kjempegod jobb der, det, det er jo veldig relevant når man skal ut og søke jobb. Growth mindset, det snakket jo litt manuell om. Det handler jo om eh, hvordan man, det er ikke ting, det er veldig få ting i livet som er noe man kan eller ikke kan. Man kan alltid lære seg noe nytt. Eh, man kan alltid Eh, se på nye temaer, og det, det jeg har som huskeregel her, det er hvis noen spør deg om du kan en ting, så er svaret, eh, kan du ofte avslutte med, nei, det kan jeg ikke enda, i stedet for at nei, det kan jeg ikke, så er det noe man alltid kan lære seg. Målsetting, det å sette tydelige mål og jobbe mot de målene, eh, det er noe Erling har eh, lært gjennom hele skiskytt i karrieren sin, det at man må sette seg mål og jobbe mot de målene. Og det er, det er der OKR kommer inn. Og rapportering, det er også nyttig. Og evaluering av hvordan man jobber. Og så går man ned på disipliner. Og det er kroker å henge ting på. Der har du, og der finnes det også sikkert masse forskjellige måter å bygge det opp på. Men det vi har gjort i Nevo, det er å kategorisere det som søkemotormarkedsføring. Under der er det søkemotoroptimalisering og Google Ads og andre eh, søkemotormarkedsføringsselskaper. Eh, Så har det displayannonsering, sosiale medier, analyse, eh, conversational marketing, storytelling og UX. Det er sånn vi har lagt opp. Så er det viktig å si at det ikke er direkte link mellom det mørkeblå og det lyseblå. Ja, det, så, det, så denne her kan antageligvis gjøres bedre. Men for å, se, for å vise dere hvordan man bruker dette her, så har jeg satt opp min egen. Eh, og dere kan, det dere kan gjøre her da, det er å trykke der. Og så kan dere enten eh, bare kopiere og så ha deres egen private, eller så kan dere duplikate, eller kopiere, tror jeg det er. Eh, du, duplikate, sånn. Og da kommer det opp en egen, og så legger du inn navnet ditt her. 
Og så hvis det er veldig hyppig, så kan du legge inn for eksempel da Julie hopp her. Og måten du bruker dette rammeverket på er at hvis du, hvis du har litt grunnleggende kompetanse om for eksempel SEO, så tar du bare og legger på en farge. Nå husker jeg ikke helt hvilken farge vi brukte her. Det var ikke den i hvert fall. Den kanskje? Nei, det var ikke. Men hvis du føler at du er, hvis du er nybegynner, hvis du liksom har lært litt om begrepene SEO og kanskje du vet hvordan du rangerer, hvordan din blogg rangerer, hvordan du kommer opp i søkeresultatet når noen søker etter navnet ditt. Hvis du vet at liksom, nøkkelord, litt om keyword research, hvis du, leser, liksom, hvis du leser et par blogginnlegg og kanskje skriver et blogginnlegg om hvordan rangere høyt i organisk resultat i Google, så kan du, da er du nybegynner. Og så hvis du har jobbet med det litt, grann, så blir du, da kan du kanskje utvide den her til til å jobbe med det, og hvis du er viderekommende, så har du jobbet med det i praksis over to år. Eh, avansert, da kan du liksom, da, da begynner du å bli veldig god på det. Eh, og så har du spesialist, da måten vi gjør det på det er at hvis du er blitt så god på et tema at eh, folk kontakter i Nevo på grunn av en person, og navnet til en person, så regnes du som en spesialist. Og så er det eh, nivå 6, da er du regnet som en av de 10 prosent beste jentene i Europa eller Norge på det tema. Og da må man ofte ha en ekstern evaluering. Da finner man en person, for eksempel som innenfor analyse, så vil jeg, eller AB-testing, så vil jeg sagt at manuell. Da tar den personen en prat med manuell, og så, og så spør, spør jeg manuell, ok, hva synes du om den personen? Hvor, vil du rangere? Hvor god er den personen? Og hvis da Manuel sier at denne personen er liksom en jeg kan anbefale til å holde foredrag eller til å jobbe med avanserte SEO-prosjekter, så er du liksom kommet til nivå 6. Og sånn er det bortover hele her. Så, så jeg, jeg, er jo, jeg regner meg selv som nybegynner i veldig mange temaer, og så er det noen ting jeg har jobbet med ganske mye. Og så blir man jo utdatert ganske fort. Så... LinkedIn er nok den tingen som jeg føler at uh, jeg, jeg er både dybde og bredde, uh, og har jobbet med lenge og er rimelig oppdatert. Jeg tror jeg kunne holdt et LinkedIn-kurs. Og analyse, der er, jeg, der er det jo egentlig erfaring og det at du forstår forretningsutvikling. Det at man kan se på noen tall og, så, og stille gode spørsmål. Og så er det mange ting... Uh, og så er det en ting jeg har lyst til å gjøre nå i år, det er å ta, nå har jeg sett at CXL sine kurs, der har de en sånn der koronadiscount, så det betyr at man får tilgang til veldig mye for 300 dollar eller noe sånt, så det, det kommer jeg til å gjøre i sommer. Så, og her kan man gå inn og så bare evaluere seg selv, og hvis, du har lyst, hvis dere har lyst i klassen til å, å evaluere dere selv her, så er det jo også en, hvis man sier at man er ekspert, og med en gang man snakker med deg, at du, du, man oppdager at du, er, du, har, du, har, du har veldig mye selvtillit, men du har ikke så mye selvinnsikt, så er jo det også en grei med dette her. Det er bare frivillig. Så måten man gjør det på, lag en duplikat, legg inn navnet ditt. Nå har jeg lagt inn Juli Hopp, så jeg forventer at du i hvert fall går inn og... Nei, du trenger ikke å gjøre det. Jeg skal dele denne her også i... I, det er også sånn hvis, hvis jeg blir spurt om noe nå, og det, det ligger noen folk inni her, det som er problemet med denne modellen da, det er jo at jeg må gå inn og være enkelt. Jeg skulle ønske at det var mulig å lage en, en modell som gjorde at, ok, hvis noen spør meg om jeg trenger noen som kan hjelpe oss med sosiale medier, så skulle jeg ideelt sett kunne gå inn her og så sett hvem av studentene er det som er, er gode på sosiale medier. Det løser du enkelt med en pivot-tabell. Ja, men jeg er ikke så god på pivot-tabeller, så... Og så må du henge sammen med alt det andre her også. Så det, å, det kunne jo kanskje du og jeg jobbet litt aktivt med å lage dette her i rammeverket, Anders, for studenter. For jeg har sett på en del av de profesjonelle, de som har brukt dette her i mange år, det, det er masse feil, eller masse ting som kan forbedres i det. Så vi kan videreutvikle det. Da sier jeg... Ja, skal vi se her om det har kommet noe mer. Nei. Skal vi rapportere OKR i Basecamp? Jeg anbefaler det. Uh, I fjor, så, etter siste forelesning, så så jeg veldig fort uh, 
uh, vem som liksom var engagerad och det är er de som uh, fortsätter att rapportera helt till man uh, føler att man är er färdig med nettbutiksprojektet. Anders, har du någon fråga eller jag kommer att vara med på någon föreläsning framöver men då kommer jag till att ställa frågor och lytte inne Ja. Jeg ønsker egentlig bare velkommen til neste del av kurset som starter 26. Jeg skal legge ut en sånn liste over vad som sker. og det kommer til å være også en del gjesteforelesere da, men også fokus på at det skal